the Hagman and Hagman Report for today. It is a terrific Tuesday edition. It is December 2nd, 2014. I'm Doug Hagman, co host along with my son, Joe Hagman. Together, we are the Hagman and Hagman Report, both of us in studio today. Folks, you're about to hear three hours of unbiased, uncensored news information and analysis of the news. The headlines that escape your attention, perhaps the headlines that are hiding in the creases and the folds of the newspapers and the magazines and the and of course that never make it to mainstream media. That's what we focus upon. Folks you're listening to the only show where the news is presented to you in three D. Maybe we should have three D earbuds or three D glasses. We look well beyond the headlines and the bylines, bring you the news behind the news and folks, today's broadcast in portions of today's broadcast. I'm so thankful for this company. Brought to you courtesy of harrys.com. That's harrys, H-A-R-R-Y-S.com. Folks, if you go to hagman and hagman.com, click on the, go scroll all the way down to the bottom there. And in the footer section of our website is a link to Harry's. Folks, I don't endorse anything. I don't personally use, take, ingest, whatever myself and Harry's is a company I am so proud we Joe and I are so proud to uh, to endorse and so proud that they've asked us to partner up be, spon- be sponsors of our show harrys.com that's dot com. yes Joe I'll tell you you're it's looking changed, much better uh, changed my shaving experience it's a uh, product I will hope to be able to continue to use uh, for as long as possible as it, long as uh, they keep making the blades, buddy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it's a, it's not just the blades, or it's not just the cream, or the aftershave. It's a combination. Uh, it's some of the softest, gentlest shaving cream that I've had. Uh, the the razor, um, the way that they they make up their their razors, uh, must have been done in a way where they are aerodynamic, or at least they work in oh, a way man. that don't they don't aggravate people with sensitive skin or eczema or let alone people like me who just are, are are rough when I shave and cut myself, you know, from from not taking my time. It's a it's a great shaving experience. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so so much for doing a commercial at the beginning of our show. But anyway, thanks folks for joining us. Thank you for your belief and your trust in us as we walk through this minefield of current events together. I just want to remind folks, new listeners, thanks for checking in. Uh, a very special hello to Annie who's uh, uh, listening live, Annie from Nevada. God bless you, Annie, just outside of Las Vegas. Uh, Thanks for sending me the email, and thanks for sharing your story with us. Um, Folks, you can tune us in 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Our home base on the Internet is Hagman and Hagman.com. I'm going to have some stuff up there. going to be working on some stuff tonight. Um, some quick uh, housekeeping items. Um, sure, Let, let's get let's get into some. Yeah, let, let's take care of some business. Let's uh, let's start with Thursday. Thursday, we're going to have Paul McGuire on the show. Now, he's a, a prolific author, speaker, uh, uh, friend of the show. He's been on several times. Many of you are familiar with him, but he has been hosting these prayer meetings that have been going on now for a few months in at the Sportsman Lodge in Los Angeles. And he is uh, very convicted, I should say, uh, as I read some emails from him this week. Uh, he'll be coming on Thursday not only to talk about the uh, how to get to the, the prayer meeting at the Sportsman Lodge, but also what the Lord has, has laid on his heart as far as the urgency for the people of the Lord uh, to, to be prepared for spiritual warfare, the battle of spiritual warfare. And how to not only access these uh, you know, weapons of spiritual warfare, but how to put them into practice. And, and uh, he's got a, an urgent message to share. Uh, go to PaulMcGuireUS.com. Di- Paul Is that right? PaulMcGuireUS.com? No, I never get that right. It's uh, PaulMcGuire.us. <laughs> In fact, um, you yeah. can go to it. It, it, it. Folks, if you go to Hagman and Hagman.com now, if you go to past shows or yeah. show archive, I'm sorry, show archive. Or past shows, it'll take it both same place. You can I see it here. You you, you can go scroll down and right from uh, the home page on the left hand yeah. side, on the right hand side. You've been uh, and for folks that have been paying attention to the website, my dad's uh, implemented a new format and he's been changing 
uh, and using different functions of it. So if you see, you know, like yesterday, there was a circle of trust there in the middle column. That's been taken out and moved, and it's playing around with different designs. So um, just wanted to let you guys know that he, uh, you're, going, you're not going yeah, crazy. <laughs> easier on the eyes for people as old as I am, I suppose. And uh, the message from Paul McGuire is that there's chaos and supernatural deliverance, a prophetic warning for 2015. Um, he's, Paul McGuire will be giving um, one of the most important prophetic messages of his ministry, entitled Chaos and Supernatural Deliverance, a Prophetic Warning for 2015, uh, which is sponsored by the Paradise Mountain Church on December 11th, 2014, that's a Thursday, at the Sportsman Lodge, which will accommodate up to 2,000 people in Studio City, California, starting at 6.30 p.m. The event and parking is free, but you need to register. And you can register right off Paul McGuire US, uh, Paul McGuire. Paul US, McGuire. US. his site, right. uh, the first article, the whole first front page of his website has um, the story there, and I'm posting a link in our interactive chat. So check that and out. If you're in the uh, area, you please attend since it's free. Um, it, there's no reason not to if you're in the area and, and available. And for those listening to this via archive, what I'll do is I'll put these entire, or I'll put that up on our website as well, Hagman and Hagman.com, a link to Paul's website. Uh, it will be in the main story section. That way no one misses it. When is this again, Joe? Yeah, it, it, Thursday, Thursday December 11th. So that would be a week, uh, week from uh, Thursday two days from now. at the I, Sportsman I, Lodge. I, and, uh, oh, man, i got to tell you, I, I, I want to oh. go. <laughs> yeah, I wish it was only a few thousand miles closer. It is uh, the Sportsman's Lodge, 6.30 p.m. in Studio City, California. No, that's 6.30 Pacific time. Yeah, so it would be 9:30 uh, Eastern time. So if you're out in that, if you're out in that area, we give you full permission not to listen to the show live that night. Definitely, Paul yeah. uh, um by, by the way, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mean to sound uh, presumptuous there or haughty there. You know, I, I just uh, certainly, uh, man. Uh, when if Paul I was McGuire speaks, in, if Paul was speaking in our area, I would. <laughs> we, we, no, we, 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 I'll tell you what, we would definitely speak. we'd put a microphone in front of him in front of him and ha- have him deliver, you know, live because uh yeah. when Paul McGuire says something of that nature that it's that important, folks, please. Um and I've known Paul and I've we've both Joe and I have met with Paul and met with him privately and for extended periods. And I've got to tell you, he is knowledgeable beyond Beyond my, I mean, beyond your wildest uh, imagination, um, just to talk with him, he, he, it's incredible. So yeah, definitely. and that's uh, what well, we have that show lined up for Thursday, this Thursday, and then we have uh, tomorrow. I don't know if you want to announce that or you want to. Yeah, wait. let me get into let me get into this but before you move from Paul McGuire on Thursday. Is Paul going to deliver a similar message for those who can't attend on the uh, yes. live? Okay. Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, so, folks, it's very important. Uh, the next two days are very important. Certainly, Paul McGuire on Thursday, but tomorrow is. This is extremely important. I, I probably spent an hour on the phone with Steve today, Steve Quayle, and um, uh, we, we talked about a lot of things, and I mean a lot of things. Uh, folks, Steve is coming on tomorrow night just by himself, and we're going to have a conversation, a conversation about the war. The war that's coming, the war that's coming from within and without, the civil war that's really here in, in the in, in the third world war that's coming from without, that's in progress, or the, the stage is being set for that. And we talked about several things uh, about what's taking place, and I got I got to tell you, uh, I remember. Steve Quayle being on with Art Bell, and we talked about this this morning. And I wrote this down because it was—I thought it was so so prophetic. And I and I spent probably an hour looking for a cassette tape. You remember what those look like, right? Cassette tapes. I spent an hour looking for a cassette tape. Those were the vinyl disc things that went. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, diamond uh, stylus. No. Um, he was on with Art Bell, and this was in ninety. 
it was in the mid 90s and he spoke about the civil war and about uh, Dmitry Dudeman's vision and such and uh, I gotta tell you we are seeing what we're seeing right now is I believe the culmination or it's coming to America it's it's already here in, in many respects so tomorrow night's program it's going to be just imagine Steve Quayle and and all of us sitting at a, at a at a kitchen table, yourself included, folks. And we're just going to be talking about what's coming. It's uh, just Steve Quayle, no no guest, just him and us, and uh, kicking back. And what I'd like you to do, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and, and I talked to Steve about this because he doesn't really like to take phone calls and and uh, and things because things kind of get off track and. Um, so if if you have any questions, and, and I ask Steve if, if this is all right, uh, basically, and if you have any questions for Steve Quayle, please, please do this. About any any questions whatsoever, and what I'll do is I'll you, you don't worry about the punctuation or spelling. I'll, I'll kind of you know. Um, uh, Trim down the questions and send him a copy. Of Subject the questions. Line. Question for Steve, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Sure, that's fine. So if you could just use the contact us form off of Hagman and Hagman, write your question. Try to be as concise as possible, if if you can. Also include your first name and your state. Yeah, I'd, I'd like that. That way we can refer to you, or as much personal information as you want to give. Especially if it's geographically oriented, the question, in other words, if it's geographically uh, focused. So, And then Steve will address each one. What I'll do is tomorrow, at least, uh, well, several hours before the show. So if you can do it tonight or first thing in the morning, I'll put this together and I'll send it off to Steve, the list of questions that you have. Um, I don't think Steve has done this before, uh, or it's been a long time. It's going to be a great show. So two important back-to-back shows, Steve Quayle on tomorrow and then Paul McGuire on Thursday. And then we have another dose of Steve Quayle as well on Friday, but he's going to be with um, Bob Fletcher. Did I get that right? You, uh, yeah. Yeah, Bob Fletcher. Bob, Bob Fletcher. Fletcher. Bob Correct. Fletcher Investigations. And we had to change around some things. We had L.A. Marzulli scheduled for Friday. He's going to be joining us Monday, December 8th. L.A. Marzulli has a, a new, another book out, brand new. Uh, and um, thankfully he agreed to, to change times. Uh, very generous with his time. And we're excited to bring L.A. Marzulli on. And he's excited to come on and talk about his latest book. So that will be Monday, December 8th. So we got a great week of hosts already, uh, of guests already lined up that will make for uh, a great series of shows and you know with steve uh, then pa- uh, paul mcguire then steve and bob fletcher after that we'll have the weekend edition with sheila then we're going to come back strong with la marzulli and we have a few other people in the works uh we do have next uh, tuesday stands coming on and then uh katie uh, who you guys know in, in in our chat room here is kw she'll be on with us the first hour next tuesday um talking about practical nutrition and uh how to apply it to our lives so uh, and that's important the closer we get to you know whatever events or event or events take place we need to be as as uh yeah well as physically fit spiritually fit mentally fit as possible and focused and and Katie can help us on that uh Katie, Katie's the one by the way who sent me the essential oils when I got that virus and whenever she, I mean, she, the stuff that she sent and I began taking it uh, made, to me, made a, a huge difference that whatever that viral yuckiness was where I lost my voice, I mean, that made my wife, uh, you know, they gave my wife a break, uh, but uh, it wasn't any fun, I got to tell you. But, and, and then to, tonight, of course, Stan Deo, second hour. So it's, it's, they're real Indiana Jones. Yeah, I mean, we love Stan, and and there's a lot uh, going on too. Man, to get there's so Stan. much. Yeah, but before we do, l- let me get into uh, two things, if if I may. Uh, this is from GrassTopUSA.com, an article by Don Fetter 
or feeder, Fetter, I suppose, F E D F like Frank, E D E R, Don Fetter, Grass Top, USA.com. This caught my attention when I was doing some research on another matter today. Another week in Obama's war on America. That's right, target America. You know, Don writes, uh, Obama isn't at war with ISIS, the Taliban, or the Muslim Brotherhood. We know that, folks. Now, this is me, obviously, uh, giving some uh, commentary. It's, it's, he's at war with the Constitution, and he's at war with the middle class. You and I, it, I I'm not even sure we're middle class anymore, Joe. Seriously. I'm not even sure there is a middle class. You know, middle class anymore, I think, is is what would be considered 15 years ago to be uh, the richer class or the higher class. Um, maybe, uh, maybe not. I mean, maybe well, they, there's I mean, only two know, classes in America now. There's, there's the. I mean, we're blessed beyond what we deserve. Uh, you know, we all have shelter over our head. We have food in our mouths. We have families. Uh, or friends uh, in Christ, we have the Lord also uh, above all things. So we're, you know, just by default, and, and being living in the, living in this country and living in a situation where we have those necessities, um, we are all blessed. Uh, and beyond that, when you get into to um, you know social classes, well, depending on the family you have or the ministry you have and what your needs are and what you you know you need to take care of and. and how you use what you're given to serve the Lord, that's where you start getting into, uh, you know, a little bit of different terminology uses. What, I mean, what's middle class if you make, you know, 60 grand a year, but you you know you give 10 of it away and you take 10 more and use it to uh, put toward, towards projects for feeding people or, or educating people or, you know what I mean? Uh, you help your other family members out. Maybe you have a, a sister or brother uh in law that you know, yeah. you're giving aid to so that they can continue to live because they're having problems with work. Yep. I mean, the middle class is uh, there's a, it's a, filled with many different types of people. And then you have those who, who uh, you know, make decent money and like, you know, the newest things, uh, have pride in, in, in stuff, which is obviously not the, the right mindset to have. But unfortunately, many people out there due to the mind control based uh, conditioning through the TV have been um brainwashed to think that way and uh, so you have a lot of different you know types of of people and a lot of different types of wealth that go along with those different types of people so um and, and there's so many people out there today and, and folks I, I I believe that the majority of our listeners are probably like this where you're making up right now the difference in your income people are I love it when people say, oh, we've never been better off economically. And there are people out there saying that, citing jobless numbers, you know, improving jobless numbers and uh, GDP and, and what have you. And, of course, we know the numbers are rigged. Um, however, the inflation, for example, or the um, – it's getting harder and harder to leave the grocery store without spending $50 or – Without speed, yeah, I mean, it goes very quickly. And and my wife and I were talking about that. Uh, no longer can we run into the grocery store and buy a few things and and not have it hit you in the pocketbook like a like a sledgehammer. So I mean, we coupon shop, obviously, use coupons and and uh, yeah. take advantage of that. I, I tell you, my wife's really turned into a. Uh, uh, here we have a grocery store chain, Giant Eagle, and you buy groceries from them every yeah, amount. Listen to this. Every amount of money you spend there, I think it's every fifty dollars you spend at Giant Eagle, you get ten cents off a gallon of gas. They have a gas station. So, uh, what my wife's done is they run these specials on selling uh, uh, gift cards, and they do twenty cents off for every fifty dollars uh, you spend in gift cards. So what my wife did and has been doing is, if we need to go somewhere to buy something from Lowe's, we'll say, or uh, any any place that uh, sells gift cards, which many do, Target, I mean, just think about any commercial store, restaurant, you name it. She'll buy the gift cards, get the, the money uh, so we have money off gas. And they uh, we just went and filled up the other day paying $0 for 30 gallons of premium gas. Now, that's after a month of buying, uh, you know, 
gift cards for the appropriate store you need to purchase things from and and you're using an office where you go through a lot of ink and office supplies so you go buy a best buy card etc and you use it and the money builds up and then from groceries it builds up too but uh that was the first time we were able to through her thrifty shopping uh get 30 gallons of free premium gas uh which i thought was pretty neat um, yeah and and this is what we resort to i mean when i say we i think i think everyone does this it, it's um you, you just do this. Uh, it's smart. Uh, when I uh, we we went out y- yesterday, we had to discuss something out of the office, so we took a ride. And I'm riding in his car, and I'm hearing this sloshing and banging. And and I asked him what it was what he was carrying. And of course, I think twenty ga- or yeah, twenty gallons of gas in in his uh, in the back of his vehicle. So uh, and that of course is as he said. You know, I mean. Think about that. You, you you go to one store to buy a gift for, gift card for another store, and, and you get free gas. That's uh, interesting. But anyway, uh, but so so the war is really Obama. And let me add this to what Don Feder Feder has said. Not only is Obama at war with the middle class, but the entirety of Congress, I believe, is at war with the middle class. Anyone in Washington, anyone inside the Beltway, anyone appointed is at war with the middle class and ultimately with every American out there. And if you're listening to this in a foreign country, whether you're American or not, if you're West, uh, if you're a Westerner, uh, you are a target as well. As far as Obama is concerned, the 2014 election was liberating for him. There's no longer a need to pretend to cover up his actions, at least not for the sake of his party, for those who continue to believe in the right-left political paradigm. And again, I'm paraphrasing here from Don Fetter, grasstopusa.com. Um, and so there's no longer a need to, to, for him to... Uh, for him to pretend that he feels anything but contempt for the nation he was elected to govern. Last week was typical on Monday after a grand jury refused to indict Officer Darren Wilson for acting in self-defense. A mob once again rampaged, of course, in Ferguson. We all bore witness to what happened there. And after mouthing a regulation issue call for calm, the renegade in chief used the chaos of the mayhem to push his racist redist well he redistributed his racist agenda okay although there's no excuse for violence we have to understand the rage of the lynch mob the leader of the free world told us that the renegade in chief said Yes, we have to understand the rage. We need to recognize the situation in Ferguson. This speaks to the broader problems that we still face as a nation. Really, like the renegade in chief who condones anarchy, black businesses were burned to the ground in Ferguson. Now, Obama insisted there are good people on both sides of the debate. So we ask the question, who are the good people who wanted to almost literally crucify the police officer? Who were the good people who were burning the businesses? Who were the good people who were chanting, burn it all down, baby? The nation's renegade in chief is in sync with the petty criminals who loot liquor stores, shoot at police cars, burn down businesses. You know, on the day after, well, on November 5th, he held a, 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 the renegade in chief held a private meeting at the White House with the most prominent outside agitators, including Al Sharpton, who said Mr. Obama was concerned about Ferguson staying on course in terms of pursuing what it was he knew we were advocating. Parse that sentence, diagram that sentence, folks. The day before Ferguson exploded again, Obama 
gave a speech in Chicago attempting to justify his most recent spate of lawlessness. It wasn't enough for him to grant amnesty to five million illegal aliens already in violation of the law, in violation of the Constitution by his actions, by the actions of the renegade chief. No, no, he had a rubber noses in it. In his latest bitter clinger tirade, writes Don Fetter, the renegade in chief told us that only the Native Americans have a right to complain about illegal immigration. Also concerned about border security and national identity are tribalism. Sometimes we get attached to our particular tribe, our particular race, our particular religion, and then we start treating folks differently. That sometimes has been bottleneck to how we think about immigration. Ladies and gentlemen, think about that statement and really pay attention to that statement. What Don Fetter does not really get into is the fact that this is really greasing the skids for a one-world order. Really, it is, in addition to a one-world religion. Or at least, if you if you don't, if you don't want to go that far, certainly a North American Union, as, as if well, will be part of a global govern, government. So, if you want to limit the influx of eagle, uh, illegals, if you're concerned about Americans losing their jobs and criminals coming in with low-skilled workers, you're a racist pig, writes Don Fetter. So, tribalism is okay when it's Ferguson mob demanding color-coded justice, but not for a majority of Americans of all races who insist that everybody obey the law and that people who want to live in America actually become Americans. So the renegade-in-chief is using executive amnesty to help obliterate our national identity, and we've been, we've been talking about this for now two years. This is the balkanization of America. This is the ripping away of our moral, well, of our national identity and changing the morality by changing the demographics of our country. Obama, of course, wants more people living and voting in America who don't speak English, who don't know our history, who don't know our our culture. And and now this is me talking. Who Who don't give a doggone rat's behind about our traditions, our our. Judeo-Christian heritage, our Judeo-Christian foundings, and yes, it was America was founded as a Judeo-Christian nation, going back to the Pilgrims and Puritans. And maybe uh, it's not even that they don't care; it's that they hate it. it it's that it's it's a uh, um, like a, a racist hates somebody of another ethnicity. These globalists hate Christians with that same amount of hatred. Just the, the the worst kind of hatred that you could have for another human being. Uh, not even looking at them as though they were human. Well, yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, precisely. Now now we're going to the cloward piven strategy. Just, just slam everything to bring everything down. There's a video that recently surfaced. Well, I'm not. Uh, wait a second. Before no, there there was a chat actually that took place. It was an online chat with um, Hispanic bloggers last week. Health and Human Services Secretary Sylvia Matthews Burwell. She she was there in this online chat with Hispanic bloggers. And I'm not sure how many people heard about this. Uh, Here's what she said. Yeah, you know, this is kind of, this kind of flew under the radar. This uh, head of health and human services, Secretary Sylvia Matthews Burwell, said that we need to ensure that those granted amnesty, the, the new recipients of this amnesty, that they will enjoy a full range of benefits, and I'm going to quote this, in everything from health care to economics 
to so many things. Now, that's uh, contrary to what the president said during the press conference he gave when announcing the uh, executive action. Right. And and see, exactly. And here's what she's telling the, uh, the Hispanic online chatters. And it gets even better because she says this. She said this. Are you ready for this? Everyone should come on in, and folks should not be scared. No questions will be asked, and it's not about it's not a and it's not about an immigration issue. She assured them that the administration would not ask about their legal status. Now, folks, do you remember back in two thousand and nine? when the renegade in chief guaranteed that illegal immigrants would not, illegal aliens, pardon me, would not benefit from the Affordable Care Act, from Obamacare? Well, guess what? We've all been suckered. You feel like a sucker, ladies and gentlemen? You feel like you've been suckered? And, of course, we saw that recent video, uh, uh, Hans Gruber from, uh, what was that? Bruce Willis movie, uh, not Death Wish, uh, Die Hard. Yeah. Hans Gruber's uh, brother, Jonathan Gruber. And he sneered at the stupidity of the American voter for not realizing that Obamacare entailed tax hikes, tax hikes and was in reality a, a giant transfer program, a transfer of wealth, moving income from the well, from the healthy to the sick and the middle class to the renegade and chief's beloved underclass, including illegals, the lawless ones. Oh, what a great secret service code name we have in renegade and chief. The renegade, Obama's secret service code name. How appropriate. Renegade meaning lawless. What would you choose if you had a choice? And we don't, does he, did he have a choice in that? Uh, you know what? I, I don't know. I do know that uh, it's selected through a, a, a division, an offshoot of the Secret Service. What would my choice be? Would uh, he wouldn't have one? That's my that's my choice. Because see, he's in there illegally. And and, and I'll no, no. What would your now. choice if you were the president? What would, what would you choose for your name? Oh, oh for me? Yeah, yeah. I know what the audience would choose for you. I, I, I'm afraid to even ask. No, they would choose. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm serious. I have to think about that. I don't know. Uh, but uh, hopefully, hopefully, a good guy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> a fitting name for this president would be a confused in chief. Uh, you know, with the saying one thing, acting in a completely opposite manner, um, making promises. Oh, he's not confused. You know. No, well, the, from the beginning messages from his opening campaign statements uh, at the beginning of the first term uh, till the promises he's made then and, and what he's said and done until now, um, uh, you know, from you can keep your doctor, you can keep your plan to, you know, uh, all these lies, all these misstatements, double talk that we've seen coming from him. It's just, uh, it's been one contradiction after the next. You know, just an example is what you just iterated about the reiterated about the um, benefits that you know potential uh, new citizens or um, what, how, whatever yeah, you want to call yeah. them, immigrants will be receiving. Illegal Part of his statement was, you know, lawbreakers. this does not mean that you know they will uh, these uh, people who are now legalized will be entitled to any type of benefits or you know blah 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 blah. And he goes on to say that Congress would need to be a the the uh, agency or the legislative branch that would have to create uh, the laws to get those types of, of funding for these immigrants through. But well, yeah, and, and in, in tandem with that, um, where is Congress in all of this? Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. They're both the same. They they both are facilitating this. I, I I believe that the a, every person in Congress has has been is part and parcel to this this uh, uh, law lawful uh, unlawful uh, program. It's actually law that they are. 
<laughs> they are. It's actually the law that they remain uh, uh, ceremonial <laughs> only. Yeah. And, and well, it is. Well, consider this. I mean, if you're in the middle class, and I suspect, you know, 99.9% would be, or, or I mean, I, the majority would be um, listeners, or, or some some portion of the middle class, maybe the lower middle class or the upper lower middle. I, I don't know, but but think of this: it doesn't matter because really, what Obama has done, and it, with, and not just Obama, but with the with the Democrat and Republican congressional folks. He took the national debt from 10.6 trillion to 18 trillion. At the same time, cutting the deficit in half. Yeah. How does that work? How does that work? Common Core is a is a beauty uh, when used properly. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and during the renegade in chief's first illegal term is uh, illegal occupancy. Over 11,000 recipients were added to the food stamp rolls every single day. When was this? During, well, during the renegade in chief, during Obama's first term. Yeah. And think about this. Because during about Bush's about term, his two terms, he more than doubled the food stamp recipients uh, as well. Well, it, you see, the Republican versus Democrat, that whole meme is, is just is just gone. It, it's it's gone. They're cutting deals and, and we nowhere clearer do we see this this in the Benghazi investigations. And this is something else I want to get to real quick here. But um just to finish up with Don Fetter's article here from uh, uh, what did I say that website was here, uh, grasstopusa.com, just to finish up on this. Um, Obama thinks we're all ignorant and bigoted, uh, or at least he's exploiting the bigoted section. He believes that America's success is built on exploitation at home and abroad. He wants to see the U.S. emasculated militarily. And, folks, he's doing a great job of that. Our economy crippled and the nation overrun with the denizens of the third world. Well, everything that, that Obama and this Congress, and I'm adding this Congress to this article, Everything that, that is being done is part of a continuing course of criminal conduct or a continuing pattern toward the destruction of our country and the implementation of a, of a single global governance. Now, some people will say that's conspiracy nonsense, but it's not. Um, that's why in Obama's land, the Obama land once known as America or called America. That's why in Obama's mind, we are no longer a Christian nation. But bear in mind, Islam certainly has made important contributions to America. You're just going to have to show me where, folks. Business owners aren't responsible for their own successes. This, according to the renegade in chief, remember, you didn't build that. His ideological imperative even comes into play in such unlikely areas as disease control and Middle East policy. I mean, folks, really, Obama will go down in history as the person in the White House to bring Ebola into this country? <clears throat> You know, instead of instituting some sort of travel ban, Obama brought patients here for treatment at our expense and sent soldiers to empty bedpans and to become infected themselves over in Africa. How's and that for duty? What you mentioned and, and what's been brought up recently on our show about the comments Obama made about the businesses, you didn't build it. 
uh, somebody else did. That only concerns me if they're saying that from the standpoint is you didn't build it, we're going to take it from you, uh, rather than you know you didn't build it, somebody else gave it the opportunity or or you know ability to do it. Wait, what? No, you can't be. You can't. I mean, be serious. I. I Otherwise, it's empty rhetoric. If he's just saying, you know, you didn't build your business, I mean, it's it's, it's worthless. And then, unless they mean it in the context, well, you didn't build it, so we're going to take it from you by, you know, uh, marketing strategies by oh man, regulation. you deeper. That's the wrong way. Oh, I'm thinking I disagree. If he's just saying it, you know, you didn't build that because you were it was built for you by the opportunities of others. I see that as empty rhetoric versus an actual danger of it coming from a standpoint where they're talking about you didn't build it, so it's ours now. Okay, you, you kind of saved yourself uh, there in that last half paragraph. Okay. Well, you, you know, look at uh, Obama when he deals, and Kerry, and Hillary, and Bill Clinton, by the way, and we're going to be seeing a lot more of Hillary and Bill Clinton. I can tell you this, and as the years go on, um, where there's Hillary, there's Bill. Now, the the opposite, I don't believe, necessarily applies. In addition to the, <laughs> to, uh, I'm not going to go there. Never mind. And and those people listening to this know where I was headed. So anyway, uh, think about uh, how the Middle East uh, Middle East process is going. And and Bush had the same problem, and Clinton had the same problem, and. Bush, the senior, Bush, the elder, had the same problem. And it goes back, Carter had the same problem. And every, it seems like every person who occupied the Oval Office had a similar problem. Consider that every time the Palestinians commit some sort of atrocity, the renegade in chief, Obama, plays the moral equivalency card. This, according to Don Fetter, of course, um, think about the three Jewish teenagers kidnapped and slaughtered and Obama encourages Israel. What was Obama's response? He encourages Israel and the Palestinian Authority to refrain from steps that could further destabilize the situation. Are you kidding me? Really? In Israel's case, that means seeking justice. Don't do it. So that's that. That's a great article by Don Fetter again, um, GrassTopUSA.com, and of course I threw some of my own commentary in there. Uh, one last thing, I just want to reiterate, and I'm working on a report about this, and and I really want folks. We've really got to keep the pressure on uh, the Boston Globe today. I. I you know, it, it. Oh man, I don't even. I don't even know how to. Not lose my cool when I talk about this. So, yeah, sometimes I, I get very emotional. But the Boston Globe ran an article by Michael Cohen. It's an opinion article, but. But th- this, seems to be, what everyone is, thinking, and this seems to be the official narrative. Folks, remember the and, and I consider myself a very prolific author about Benghazi, having the benefit of intelligence insider information. But the Boston Globe opinion piece by Michael Cohen is titled "The Real Benghazi Scandal." In case you missed it, by the way, last week, well, on November twenty-first. The House Intelligence Committee perpetrated one of the more surreptitious Friday news dump in recent memory. They dropped a comprehensive two-year report that debunked pretty much every myth about the 2012 Benghazi tragedy. Excuse me, I hit my cough button there. Did the White House send then you and then UN Ambassador Susan Rice out on a Sunday morning talk show circuit to mislead Americans about the attacks. No, the report said she was merely stating what uh, were at the time the best assessments of the intelligence community on what happened in Benghazi. Now think about that, okay? Was there an intelligence 
a failure prior to the attacks? No. Was the military prevented from offering support or even worse, given a stand down order by the White House? No. There were not any U.S. military assets able to respond quickly enough. This, according to the House Intelligence Committee report released on November 21st. Now, I'm not going to read this, of course, but um, the report, I'll just say this, the, uh, I'll just paraphrase from this. Cohen writes that these sober findings are not only consistent with two years of statements from the White House, the State Department, and the intelligence community, but they stand in stark contrast to the unceasing stream of innuendo and unsupported allegations of wrongdoing that have been irresponsibly alleged ever since four Americans were killed during a terrorist attack on U.S. diplomatic facilities. So, folks, Joe and I, others, we are irresponsible, and we have certainly um, thrown out these this unceasing stream of innuendo and unsupported allegations of wrongdoing. Notice, folks, that this report... This November 21st report is a, bi- well, it's actually a Republican product. I find it very interesting. Let me pull this up here. Um, I find it very interesting that the actual report is uh, 37 pages, and there were, I believe, 17 points made 17 findings, one of which was the CIA did not engage in any unauthorized weapons arming shipments. That's right. They didn't. And you know why they didn't? See, people will people look at that and say, see, told you, there were no arms shipped. No. Here's the reason. You've heard of the Gang of Eight, right? The Gang of Eight. The Gang of Eight that was created... G8? No, no, no. This is a Gang of Eight within our own Congress. The Gang of Eight was created as an Intelligence Oversight Act of 1980. Currently consists, consists, by the way, of John Bonner, Nancy Pelosi, Mike Rogers, Charles Rupin... Rupert's Burger. I'm sorry about that. Charles Rupert's Burger. Mitch McConnell, Harry Reid, Diane Feinstein, and Saxe Chambliss. Right. That's the gang of eight. Democrats, Republicans. Everyone I just mentioned knew what was going on, what the secret covert illegal, international law-breaking operation was taking place in Benghazi and all across North Africa. That led to four Americans being killed, including one ambassador. Mike Rogers is the signatory on this report that was done on November 21st. Well, Huh. Mike Rogers and, and uh, Charles Ruppersberger were actually the co-authors of this report. Nowhere in this report does it suggest that the entire House Intelligence Committee even saw the report. It would stand to reason that, that they should have or would have or could have, but it's not stated as such. But let's talk about Mike Rogers for just a just a moment here. Well, let's talk about the report real quick. You see, as investigators, Joe and I, when when we sit down to interview, and and I've done this numerous times, whether it is within the walls of Attica, been there, or at someone's kitchen table, excuse me, coughing spell there, You've got to know the right, the proper questions to ask. If you don't ask the right questions, you're not going to get the right answers. Simple as that. It's not about 
diplomatic security because it wasn't a diplomatic consulate, embassy. It wasn't any of that. We know that. We've been over this and over this and over this. But yet this report goes into talking about the security, goes into intelligence failures. But see, none of the right questions were asked. Zero. Now, Mike Rogers. Mike Rogers is an interesting person to be writing this report or, or putting, signing this report. There's an email obtained by Judicial Watch. It was released back in April. Senior White House Communications Advisor Ben Rhodes. Now, remember, Ben Rhodes is the brother of a CBS News, a CBS News correspondent. Anyway, he instructed the administration media spinners in the aftermath of the attack to underscore that the protests were rooted in an internet video. But I digress. I digress. Mike Rogers, if you look at his background, you've got to look at his wife as well. Here's the deal. The and by the way, there, there no issue dominated Rogers' time as committee chairman more than Libya. If you go back to February of 2011, protests against Gaddafi, that's when they began in March. NATO airstrikes commenced, and so on. That's when U.S. Uh, the, the United States named. Christopher Stevens, a special envoy to ben, the Benghazi-based Libyan opposition. And then by August, I'm just refreshing your memory here, by August, the end of the Gaddafi regime was in sight. The AP reported that the CIA and the State Department were working closely in tracking down the dictator's vast arms stock- stockpiles, including chemical weapons, yellow cake, uranium, some 20,000 shoulder-fire missiles known as man pads. Well, the State Department spokesman Victoria Newland told AP that Stevens is working with officials in Benghazi on how to track down these weapons. Well, okay. Uh, if um, if you look at Ms. Rogers, Mr. Rogers' wife, Ms. Rogers' wife uh, was was working for a company called Aegis, A-E-G-I-S. Aegis Defense Services. See, Christy Rogers, after years of government service in mid-level administrative positions, well, she moved into the private sector, as many of these people do, and she joined the British-based security contractor Aegis Defense Services to help open its subsidiary here in the U.S., and many publications, including the newsletter Intelligence Online, noted that thanks to Representative Rogers' wife, Christie, thanks to her efforts, Aegis won several major contracts with the U.S. administration. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. You see, but of course, the spokesman for the House Intelligence Committee noted that Strictly observed and enforced policies required that there be no interaction with Mrs. Rogers on any matter relating to official business of the House. Feel better now? And then no interaction between the committee and any representative of ages. Feel better now? <laughs> and, oh, and no, there's no evidence of wrongdoing by Representative Rogers or ages. You see, I pick on Republicans as much as I do Democrats, right? It's because they're all of the same cloth. But anyway... Folks, follow the money. Follow the money. The uh, uh, Mrs. Rogers from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Um, well, oh, I, I just I want to be very very specific and careful with what I say. As Representative Rogers, as he assumed control of the Intelligence Committee <laughs> and Aegis subsidiary, Aegis Advisory, began setting up shop in Libya 
Oh, how, how convenient. Aegis began operating in Libya oh, right around February of 2011. Uh, there was a report out, it was more confidential, notes that the company's ability to provide proprietary information and expert knowledge from their country, uh, it, it, I'm sorry, their country team based in Tripoli. Security was part of that Aegis package, too. Aegis had very extensive links in Libya, links which couldn't, could be leveraged quickly to ensure safe passage. For example, Al Jazeera reported that Aegis was hunting bigger game in the country, for example, than the weapons mentioned in other actions as well. They were seeking a $5 billion, that's billion with a B, contract to guard Libya's borders. My goodness, and the borders of... Joe, the borders of Libya are more of a priority than our own southern border. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Well, we'll have our time as uh, we see the destabilization of the United States happening. Uh, it's just like we destabilize the Middle East and Libya being one of those countries. It will be destabilized here. Uh, all that much worse. And, you know, we're, yeah, we're up against the top of the hour. Yeah, I know. Here. I just... I, I want to say one more thing here because they just took a very specific interest in the events in Benghazi. One recipient of Aegis Advisories Libya briefings was Stratfor. Just folks, just think about that. Stratfor. Aegis Libya's or Aegis of Libya briefings were circulated to Stratfor's confidential alpha list. And the alpha list is a repository for most of the intelligence that comes in just keep that in the back of your mind, folks. I am in the midst of doing an investigative report that hopefully will be published at Canada the Free Press and certainly published at Hagman and Hagman dot com. And with that I know we're up against the top of the order bring stand on. We don't want to impose upon his time. Folks, this this broadcast, as we mentioned earlier, is uh, portions of this broadcast is brought to you by Harry's at Harry's dot com. Folks, I, I gotta tell you, um as we near the holiday season a lot of people are into a lot of people give gifts at this time of year a lot of people trade you know exchange presents yeah. my goodness i got a frog in my throat and one of the best gifts i i can think of to give your son your son-in-law your husband your father your brother your uncle ned even if he is a pain in the neck is one of the starter sets from harrys.com, H-A-R-R-Y-S.com. Folks, I've never used a better razor in my life. I shave every day. And Harry's is, is they've got shaving plans. For example, um, you don't ever have to step out of your house they will send you, depending on how much you shave, they ask you, how often do you shave? And if you're an everyday shaver, for example, they send you so many um, uh, so many blades and, and lotions and creams per month. If you are an occasional shaver, they, well, they adjust it to whatever your needs are. But let me tell you something. And Joe, you tell me if you, if you don't agree with this statement or even if you do. Using the... For example, the Winston razor, is it's like a massager for your face. It, and it's, as you say, it's like ergonom ergonomic. You know, I mean, it, it feels like I've never had a, a, a razor, a straight razor, or not a straight razor, but a, uh, a razor, a uh, blade razor, that felt like this, that didn't really tear up my face, or that felt as good as this, and, and I really shaving to me is a hassle, man. You know, it, it's just a, guys. You know what I'm talking about. If you if you shave every day, you know what a hassle it is. You got to slather the stuff on, and then you got to grab. You know, sometimes you run on blades, and you go to the store to get blades, and they're so expensive. And the disposable razors, they just aren't. I mean, they're made in you know, there's some they're made in China or what. You know, it's just it's a hassle. 
this, I've got to tell you, from Harry's, the, the blades, in fact, they own the factory, and the blades are fantastic. Well, Joe, you know. Uh, I mean, it's it's really, and, I, and let me tell you. Oh, it, the, it is a uh, oh. transition from any shaving experience that you've ever had, whether it's an electric razor or old, uh, you know, uh, Three, four, five blade yeah. razor. Whether they they have the vibrating feature or the or not, like I said, the the whole package. It's, it's the the shaving cream, the the combination of the, the shaving cream that they have, which is fantastic, uh, with the the razors and the aftershave, makes the whole shaving experience that much more smoother. And uh, I haven't dealt with any you know razor rash, any uh, cuts or issues like that since I started using Harry's. I, I got to tell you, the shaving cream is like no other. It is. I don't know what they what they put in it. I really don't. But uh, man, it's it, it's great. And the, there's a foaming shaving gel um, that they also have as an alternative. They have shave cream and uh, foaming shave gel. I look. I don't know what they put in this, but man, it 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 really gets into your 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 face, and it just acts like a just a wonderful. Um, uh, prep for your face, and then aftershave moisturizer. But the really big thing, and I love this, they've got three different starter packs for the Truman, the Winston, and then the Winter Winston. i got, I got to tell you, the, the Winston itself, the, the, the weight, the shape, it's just a fantastic uh, shave, just a fantastic razor. Folks, I do hope, I really do hope. If you, and, and by the way, the packaging, the presentation is absolutely beautiful. So this is something you could be proud to give a friend or even give yourself for uh, a gift. G- definitely do this. This is fabulous. In fact, I just ordered more uh, blades and some other supplies from, from Harry's yesterday. So, folks, we're big proponents. Harry's.com. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S.com. Harry's.com. Even in a crisis, you got to want to look good. you don't want to. Uh, you yeah. don't want to cut your face up. And uh, folks, I want to bring your attention to an important message for all of our listeners. I want to let you, you know and others, do you want to let others know uh, you're listening, spreading the word about our show without even saying a word? The fine people at RMS Apps, Ronnie and Kevin, have spearheaded a shirt campaign specifically for listeners to the Hagman and Hagman Report. This is a subtle way of letting people know that you listen to our show while pitching in to help us offset some of our broadcasting costs at the same time. For a limited time, for only the next 14 days, or until the 17th of December, you can purchase limited edition shirts with our famous icon, canine logo, King, featuredly, or featured prominently on the front. These uh, unisex t-shirts made of 100% cotton, long sleeve tees, heavy fabric hoodies, even camo patterns. Check them out. Go to our website at hagmanandhagman.com. That's hagmanandhagman.com. Click on the image of the shirt located on the front of the page, and it will take you to the limited time promotion page for these great shirts. Get yours today. Let others know that you are listening while doing so in in style. These also will make great gifts for the holiday and other special occasions. Again, go to hagmanandhagman.com and click on the link for the T-shirt. Now, I think we can actually uh, skip just through the break as we just did without the music. Um, and bring Stan right on. And if you're over there and Stan's ready to go, uh, give him the nod and, and uh, we'll bring him right on. Uh, we have a lot of questions for Stan. Uh, if we could, I'd like to open with the one somebody sent me, uh, which is interesting because uh, this is a problem or an issue that I have not heard of pertaining to some kind of uh, asteroid on December 7th that is going to be making some kind of close approach uh, and thank you, I believe it's Doreen, yeah. Doreen in, in the chat for this question. Um, and I'm looking up this asteroid here right now. I see what it is, 2014 WX202. Uh, at December 7th, it will be passing closest to the uh, Earth at uh, 1 LD, that's 1 lunar distance. Uh, it's 5 meters in size, and the condition code given to it is... Five. Uh, so while we're waiting for Stan, Doreen, I can just tell you uh, the condition codes are zero through nine. Um, the 
uncertainty or uh, estimate, zero through nine, zero being good, nine being highly uncertain, um, that's a a uh, relative, uh, I don't know. It's, they, they have a good idea that where it's going to go. No, sorry about that. Uh, okay, we have technical issues here. Okay, Stan, are you here? Okay, I hear Stan through your headset, Dad. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can fix this. Okay. Okay, what you can do, uh, Dad, if you can hang up with Stan, go back to BTR. Okay, hang up with Stan. Click the red button. Or go back to BTR. Yeah. Now, go to take that off hold. And Stan, if you could call back, if you could drop off and call back. Okay, well, let's let's stay and disconnect with you and reconnect or okay. drop off the call. Okay, so... So, yeah, go ahead. down one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hit that button and... Okay. Now, that call has ended. Go click the uh, hold or the... <laughs> uh, okay. How are you going to do this here? Um, What's that say between the microphone and the the... Resume yes, resume call. Okay, now it's Stan calls back. Uh, Stan, if you can hear us, you can call back at any time. <laughs> there should, or you can click the plus button there. Uh, okay. Add to this call. Okay. Search for uh, uh, Indiana Jones. I can do that. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yes, you're back along with us. I could hear Stan through your headphones. So what you did is you put the call with Blog Talk on hold, and you. Uh, we're just talking with Stan. So yeah, oh, yeah, click and then click Add to Call. And let's there see if that works. Man, I'll tell you something. I, I, you're gonna have to fire me. Cause well, the way BTR uh, formats how... the uh, show okay, here, stands on, right? Stan's yes. On. Okay. Stand there we on. go. Man, I'll tell you something, Stan. Uh, can they make this any more difficult? Uh, I mean, or, or am I just a, a moron? I, I must be a moron. I really. Certainly... Well, I wouldn't say that. Uh, the, the, the thing is, that over on your side of things, you've got more buttons to push than I do. I have to push the one that says hello. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and uh, Joe just walked me through this maze of of. Uh, well, that's fine. All right, we're not gonna. Uh, you, we could write a book on my ignorance about technology, <laughs> but uh, uh going to kick it over to Joe. Hey, Stan. Uh, great to have you back on the show. I'm going to open up with a question from a listener, and then we can take it wherever you want to go. Uh, a n- okay. listener by the name of What's Doreen wants to ask what right. your... Uh, what you what your idea is of this asteroid that's uh, going to be giving us a close call on December 7th. This is 2014 WX... 202. It is going to make a one lunar distance uh, uh, approach on the 7th of December uh, in just a few days. And the condition well, code one is 5. Dist- well, I don't know who put the, the condition code on it, but I, you know, um, I mean, one lunar distance means it's about a quarter of a million miles away. So okay. I'm not too sure that I see that as a great threat in life, but. Um, Okay. So what, yeah. Uh, I mean, where, where did she get excited about that over at uh, Space Weather or something there on their thing? Or Yeah, on spaceweather.com, um, I think is where the information came from. Or at least that's where I found the information about the asteroid. And I haven't heard yeah, about it. Yeah, I mean, it. it is. Yeah, it's a WX202, but um, it's only five meters or so. What would that be? Uh, five meters. Yeah, about. 16 feet in diameter, uh, you know, I'd be more concerned about what made the big boom over the U.K. as it was heard in the United States as well on the East Coast here in the last couple of days. Okay, I haven't heard about that. No. No. Well, the people in New York and the United Kingdom both at the same time heard multiple like shockwaves or booms, you know, I, I listened to the to the recording of it on some people's phones over there. It was boom, 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 like that. And to me, it sounded like a, a meteor that had come in high speed, but that had fragmented rather than exploded. It had fragmented and before it had gone subsonic, and so the, all the fragments started breaking the sound barrier as well. And so we had multiple shockwaves from it. But um, 
If you go on to the UK Mail online and just check out Mystery Boom, Loud Boom, I mean, it was big enough that it was like a, a Richter 1.5 earthquake uh, in New York. So um, having been underneath one of those things that came down back in 95, 94, 95, wasn't it? Something like that. I forget over in Perth, in Australia. I watched it come in, uh, a big meteor, um, and I watched it when it was several hundred miles off the coast coming in toward me. And I thought for the moment, because I, I didn't know it was at night, I didn't know that it was a meteor coming in. It looked like someone was standing in front of my house out in the street with one of those Roman candle things with bright green you know, things shooting out of the Roman candle, little spitty sparks that were greeny white. And I was impressed, thinking, well, some idiot's out here at 2 o'clock in the morning shooting off, you know, Roman candle. It's not even any holidays. And then as I watched, uh, the, the thing came bigger and bigger and bigger, and uh, still no sound. And it got so bright coming over the house that the green light woke up my daughter Laura. She thought she said she thought the Martians were invading because everything was green outside. It was the ionized nitrogen from this thing coming overhead, and then it broke apart into four pieces. Still no sound at all, and then impacted in the forest behind us. And at that time, then I started to hear dogs and barking because we heard the sonic boom from way down the coast when it had it had come in. And uh, broken the sound barrier, but the sound traveled a lot slower than this thing did. So it was, you know, several times the speed of sound coming overhead. So I know that these things do make booms. And uh, the mm, Tunguska meteor, uh, my my grandfather was alive at the time and uh, remembered uh, he was up in uh, Iowa, I think it was, and uh, as a teenager, and he remembers uh, hearing, you know, the, the big boom after this thing passed over, making a moaning sound like whoa. Like that, and went over into Russia, of course, and and uh, exploded in the air as you know as an airburst. Well, the shock wave and boom from that was heard clear around the planet. So I do think that what has happened uh, in the United Kingdom here, you know, in the last uh, oh, I guess it was a day or so, is that it was um, part of the uh, the Geminid, uh, you know, group of of meteors, asteroids, you know, or, or meteor meteors, meteorites that was perhaps one that was bigger than normal and uh, caused the sonic boom. Uh, still kind of interesting that one that big came in and, and, and made a sonic boom, though. Absolutely. Um, and that's something I'm going to... found the video. I'm going to check it out after we're uh, done with the top of the hour. Um, and, and, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's not something that I uh, heard about. And that would seem to be, to me, it, it would seem that that's something, you know, uh, very sizable and... Uh, Something's going on, you know, if it wasn't some kind of sizable uh, incoming object, then what's going on in the sky that are uh, are making these sounds uh, that are, you know, not only just in isolated areas, but the sound is spanning such a wide uh, swap of the earth. And uh, maybe... Yeah, I know. It, it pertains, we have another question from Amargo. Uh, she says, earthquakes continue in Oklahoma and Kansas, and they seem to be right to the north of us here in... Uh, Poncea City and south as well. The earthquakes well, today seem to be along I-35 and what is uh, your take of all this? Some think it's fracking, others say it's uh, because they're doing so too close to a dam and they uh, want to know if this is some kind of also a hidden agenda by the UN on a deal to get people out of this land. Well, you know, um, let me just get that phone off there. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah, Holly picked it up. Um, the the earthquakes are doing some peculiar things over in Tennessee, even as well in the Tennessee River Valley Authority upstream uh, from a, a nuclear reactor. Um, there's water seeping under the dam there, and they're thinking it might be due to a sinkhole forming somewhere near the dam. You know, the base of it. And I got to thinking about that, whether that's the cause of that particular problem of leaking the dam upstream from the from the nuclear power plant or not. That that situation could very well appear in a number of places where we've got, you know, uh, nuclear reactors near water sources, and it, you know, depending upon where it occurs, it could be real problematic to the supply of water or to the water exiting these um, nuclear reactors. Um, now the the earthquakes in Oklahoma, Texas, uh, and there's you know some down in Arizona as well, 
and and uh, you know, uh, southeastern uh, California. These earthquakes are small, but they are indicative of a pattern of fracturing. I think that is more due to the Earth itself and and the movements of the tectonic plates than it is due to fracking. You know, for oil or gas or, that, or water, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm seeing several areas on the planet that are interesting in that they're getting significant quakes in either number or magnitude where we haven't seen them before. And uh, in the last month, we've seen them over in Kenya, uh, where, you know, part of the Great East African Rift comes into Kenya and into Tanzania. And that indicated to me that there is a likelihood of a a new plate fracture occurring there, which is part of the Great East African Rift. And if you look just east of there in the North um, Indian Ocean between the southern tip of India and, say, Somalia or or the the Arabian Sea, there have been a a couple of earthquakes that occurred there in the last uh, day, which were, you know, like Richter 4s and 5s in that area, and you hardly ever see them in that area these days. And over in the Mediterranean, in uh, Greece and in Cyprus and those areas there, a little cluster four or five significant earthquakes, you know, uh, above uh, Richter four or five. Uh, Iceland continues to have earthquakes up there due to you know the magma movement. In fact, on the um, the show images page up at standale dot com, um, if you click on the show images thing there by the microphone, you'll see an Iceland uh, volcano leak. If you go there, you'll see uh, some new data coming in, new images that they're producing showing the depth of the the earthquakes underneath the Iceland volcanic rift there. And uh, they're actually allowing you to image it and move underneath the land and look from underneath in 3D at where the earthquakes are under the, the volcanic vents there. And you'll see that in the last two, two weeks, uh, I compare the two, that the volcano, uh, sorry, the earthquakes on the volcano are are becoming more and more shallow up toward the surface and bigger, which is interesting. Um, I didn't see anything on the the live uh, camera link at the moment. It's dark over there, but I didn't see any uh, flames or stuff, and I'm just wondering if things have bottled, uh, you know, and we're not seeing the magma eruption and it's building pressure and it's going to surprise, you know, people over there in Iceland shortly. I, I don't know, but that's that area, the, the uh, kind of uh, Greece portion of the Mediterranean, and the north part of the Indian Ocean between, you know, the southern tip of India and uh, Somalia coast there, the Gulf of Aden, that area. Those areas are unusually active, and I'm more concerned about that at the moment than I am the ones in Oklahoma or Texas because those are small quakes um, and could definitely be linked to the fracking operations. But one has to wonder why they're fracking there unless they're trying to relieve uh, pressure in in the, in the area that's building up, and they just don't want to say anything about it. Uh, I know that the U.S. Uh, government has done that down in Western Australia back in 78 to avert a major quake, uh, you know, 60 miles south of there in Perth. So it could be something like that happening now and being blamed on fracking, which, of course, they are doing, but it might be uh, in support of something else. I have been looking also at Yellowstone uh, for earthquakes and in the last week. And there have been a number of surges in earthquakes uh, in uh, the, the Yellowstone area, uh, more toward Madison River and some down toward the southern part of the um, uh, of, of Yellowstone, uh, of Yellowstone Park. I'm just trying to find something. Give me a second here. I wanted to see if I have that still there. Let me just see that. Yes. I don't know if I've put this up. Probably not. I was going to. It's a, a seven-day a quick scan of the um, uh, the seismometers, the, the, the um, helicopters at Yellowstone, all of them, uh, and showing how um, the the activity has increased. Uh, you know, over the last seven days, it goes up and then down, and uh, it's been very busy on a number of the uh, seismometers there at Yellowstone, which concerns me a bit. Uh, there has been some you know, weird stuff floating out there in the Internet. I've been getting emails from people saying, oh, you know, the helium-3 release there at at Yellowstone, look out, it's coming. And they're using old photographs and, you know, old uh, images and graphics and stuff to make it look like it's happening now. But the only thing that's happening at Yellowstone, in my opinion at the moment, is that we're seeing more shallow earthquakes there in a number of places all at once. 
Uh, I'm just uh, going to pull up something here and see if I can see if I can just slow it down and show you here. Okay, I'm putting that in there. Right. It's um, all right. The one that shows most activities in the southern portion of Yellowstone, it's the YMS seismometer or helicopter at Mount Sheridan. Um, although the Madison River has uh, shown activity around the same time, in fact, <laughs> quite interesting activity three or four days ago. Um, so it's it's you know if you go to the Yellowstone helicopter uh, things and and look at them, I think it'd be clever over the next few days to see if we have more of these um, earthquake clusters there. It could be indicative of something happening. I don't think we're looking at you know the major eruption you know, like a few hundred thousand years ago where we're going to blanket half of America with ash. I don't think we're seeing that at the moment, but we are seeing some increased activity there, and I know that that there's been gag orders put on USGS engineers and stuff in that area and, and uh, technical people supporting USGS seismometers and stuff. And So there, there's a reason for that, and um, so I do encourage people to look on their own at that during the week and not wait for weekly reports. Uh, you know that I might be able to deliver uh, on that. <clears throat> anyway, that's that's all related to booms and earthquakes and whatever. And um, I don't see enough at the moment to get panicky about that or the the asteroid or meteor passing you know a quarter of a million miles from Earth here in, in the next uh, few days. So hope that answers those questions. That's encouraging, by the way. I mean. Um, you know, the last thing I want to worry about, of course, well, not worry, but think about it is is the asteroid. When Joe mentioned it, I was kind of like just taken aback by that. I I, I don't know for some reason that that was on my mind, and I'm I'm glad that we really don't uh, you know um, have to worry about that. Good. Hey, a bit of of um, oh, I guess light information, uh, but but historically it looks like it's correct. Uh, the uh, UK Telegraph came up with an article on a DNA test of the British royal family. Have you seen that? No, do tell. Oh, interesting, interesting. Richard III, they found his skeleton in a parking uh, lot there in Leicester in, to, in uh, 2012. And, you know, the archaeologists were all excited about it. And with enough of the skeleton, I mean, it was, you know, preserved well enough, they could do a DNA test on it. And so when they did a DNA test on it, uh-oh, they find that he wasn't part of the royal bloodline, that he was um, <clears throat> part of an adulterous liaison somewhere along the chain, and they think around the time of Edward III in the 1300s. And so that uh, he, they, the article says they, they didn't want to claim that, you know, um, the queen shouldn't be the queen, but her royal lineage is in doubt. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So... All those people worrying about lizards or reptilians in the in the palace there may have to rethink that because, um, or, or, or well, hey, maybe not. Maybe that'll support their theory because of, of the break in the royal bloodline that it got screwed up in in, in the uh, late uh, 14th century or yeah, late 14th century. So anyway, uh, it, how did a skeleton turn up in a parking lot, or was it uh, some? Oh, sort well, they, they they were digging. Oh, you know, okay. They were they were excavating stuff, you know, for uh, additions to the to the area there, and uh, it was a, a you know chance discovery. Nobody's going to dig up you know Richard the Third on purpose, but uh, uh, anyway, that's what happened. And they were careful, as I say in the article, to to say that we're 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 just. Um, Saying hypothetically, this could affect the royalty, uh, you know, technically speaking, but it doesn't matter, you know. But <laughs> very interesting, <laughs> you know. And you, you know, I, yeah, I've been following like the the lineage of the royal family and looking at Charles and William, and especially William. And uh, uh, so that you know, very interesting and very yeah. relevant to, to that. Yeah, and I do have a so question here. I'll, do, I'll put that I'll put that over to you in the links, Joe, so you can have a look at it later. Okay, and Stan, there's this article that is might be related in a way. Uh, British royals refuse to visit Israel. Uh, I'm waiting for this to pull up. It's from the Weekly Standard. It was published on the 27th, I believe, and this article is coming real slow here. Um, right. But, yeah, British royals refuse to visit Israel, and they explained they gave three re hypothetical per uh, reasons why this may be. And as this uh, is still loading, jeez. Um, maybe we're having some kind of uh, 
bandwidth issue or, or problem. Everything's taking a long time to, to load here. Well, while, until this does load, it gave it said that, you know, no uh, current, uh, here we go. You won't find British royals in the Holy Land. Elliot Abrams calls it the bizarre story of the refusal of British royals to visit Israel where they are constantly, when they are constantly in the Arab world. It goes on to say the Queen has never set foot in Israel. Prince Charles and Prince Charles uh, set foot briefly there only once during a rabbin, a rabbin funeral. And it goes on to say, by contrast, rabbin, in, yeah. yeah, rabbin funeral. Uh, in one month, in November 2014, we found Prince Andrew and Prince Harry at what the Foreign Office must have considered a diplomatic necessity, the uh, Abdu Dhabi Grand Prix. Prince Andrew also visited, visited Saudi Arabia uh, at the request of another foreign office, but never Israel. They've never visited Israel, the, the royal family or the, the people who are their lineage that are alive today. I wonder well, what, that is interesting. It's, yeah, I wonder why that is. And if it has something uh, to do with what you just talked about. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I do think that, uh, you know, um, since the um, Balfour Declaration, or around that time, there were some uh, problems uh, between uh, the royal family and Judaism in particular. Um, I forget the details of it, but that might have something to do with it. Um, it might have something to do with the Anglican connection to the Catholic Church, Anglican uh, being the the royal religion there in England. Um, but for them not to visit, I mean, that's just weird. Um, uh, there is yeah, the some article... rumor also that... Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. The article says what? I was going to say, it does not go on to say that they've been avoiding it or, you know, declined in the invitations or have been invited it does not go on to say that either way, whether they're avoiding it or uh, just haven't got around to being there. Well, you know, the the British repartitioned uh, the Middle East after World War II, well, after World War One and, and World War II. And when they did that, they created a lot of problems in the Middle East. And so it might be that they would uh, not feel you know, safe going into Israel because of that. But... The damage was mainly done to the uh, Arab tribes, the Arab nations uh, in the area, when uh, England, you know, redivided everything through new uh, borderlines between territories and gave part of somebody's territory to the other sheikh and this and that. And uh, I mean, if you think about it, when when the Jews got on the boat and tried to get in, you know, in, in the uh, the modern Exodus, but going into the Holy Land, uh, that movie, the uh, calls you know, the Exodus there was telling about uh, the Jewish people trying to get in and the British saying, stay on the ship, you can't come back to, to, to Palestine, you know, you can't occupy it. And there was a great kerfuffle there after World War II about that. So that may be uh, part of the contributing factor about how they um, don't go there. Um, you know, Israel's got, to, you know, speaking of Israel, they've got uh, some problems there at the moment in their government. You know, Benjamin Netanyahu, I, I, I like him, I mean, his, his character anyway. And, uh, he uh, he rules a government there that has several parties involved, and and they they all have kind of a vote on the the cabinet there, depending upon how how many votes they got. And he he, he heads up a coalition. It's uh, like um, you know Democrats, Republicans, and uh, you know um, the third party, fourth party, fifth party, all kind of ruling there. And so to get government he would have to give like other prime ministers have had to do there in israel give part of the seats of government or the cabinet seats to to uh, the minor parties uh, that were elected uh, during the, the the last election well right now he's he, he's uh, just fired two of his ministers uh, the finance minister Yair lapid and the justice minister uh zippy lipney lipney and uh, they have been at odds with him, uh, you know, over things like a uh, proposed law that would declare Israel a Jewish state. And, uh, you know, because they're left wing. And um, this kind of worries me a great deal to see the government uh, fracturing like this, but I guess it has to happen, which means that around May of next year, they're going to have new elections and we may see a complete overhaul of the Israeli uh, government. 
in a time when they're going to be under attack from all sides if if ISIS keeps pressing like it's doing now. So this is another thing telling us that the you know the world is in deep do at the moment, especially over what's happening in Israel. Uh, you know, people can look that up. I'm pretty sure that Google uh, News or something like that would have it because I got my article from the Wall Street Journal. <clears throat> And uh, you know Netanyahu, by doing this, has uh, you know weakened his government in essence, calling for a new election, which means they can't do much between now and then without a lot of hassle from the minor parties. Anyway, that's that's just an aside on Israel and the Middle East, and I don't know where if that has anything to do with the, the, the royals never visiting. But uh, I certainly didn't know that they had never been there. That just uh, in thinking about that, I, it, that's interesting, very interesting. Well, if you can, if you don't mind expanding on this, where do you see? I mean, we're seeing Israel being really tightly squeezed here by our government, by by all governments. We're seeing Iran, um, you know, no agreement with Iran, or I shouldn't say no agreement, an extended timeline that was recently. Uh, 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 well, the timeline was recently extended last week um, with respect to the. Uh, Nuclear stuff. Good, thank you. Yeah, I was having a, bl- uh, a blank out there for a second. I'm having a senior moment. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. I got to tell you, it's uh, <laughs> it must be the the vodka and the coffee or something. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Uh, yeah. You, you know, Cut down on that emails. coffee. How could email saying you drink? No. Uh, really, we're seeing. I, I really do think that we're seeing this great squeeze on Israel. Um, and it's almost as if Obama is is just begging Israel to go after Iran unilaterally. I mean, you know, by by by, by themselves. You see this taking shape anytime soon, or um, I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what's your gut feeling about this? Oh, um, my gut feeling is uh, is that we're walking a knife edge, uh, the whole earth, you know, watching what happens in Israel, and this issue with Iran has gone on way past the. The fail-safe line, according to Netanyahu, as far as them taking action to stop them uh, from having a nuclear weapon to to use on on Israel, I think, you know, you'd have to watch the the rats deserting the ship. If the Palestinians were all, all of a sudden start to run out of Israel, you know, on a certain day, I'd say that they've got word from Iran they're going to nuke the area, and so they'd run. I don't think this will uh, be allowed to happen. I, I do think that Israel will make a, a preemptive uh, strike of some sort on the nuclear facilities there. And you and I both know that the the White House administration here, and not just Obama, but him and his whole team of, of ghouls are really trying to sink not only the United States, but Israel as well. Um, you know, they, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of them, of, of our administration, because they are certainly doing everything they can to hurt Israel and at the same time to hurt us, the, the America that you and I grew up in. Um, and I just don't know how much longer this will go, whether they'll let it run, you know, let Christmas happen, then after that drop the hammer on the, the U.S. dollar and the economy, or that, that uh, Iran will be, uh, you know, attacked. Um, Obama is just such a, a weak sister in a lot of ways. that he, he wants to get other people to do his dirty work, you know, and his dirty work is not something that I approve of, you know, and a lot of us don't. He is definitely not pro-Israel. There's no question about it. Yeah, exactly. And, and Stan, if I can ask you this, and I know that you and I um, and Joe, we've talked about this before. Um, there is so much anti-Semitism out there, and uh, people have a tendency to equate Israel, the Jews, with the Zionist bankers. You know, the people who, um, the, 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 you know, the old story. Well, the Jews control everything. The, the Jews control the media, the banks, and all this, and. Uh, even back to the Rothschilds, and, and uh, they're part of the Illuminati. I mean, r- some really rabid and visceral comments that you see against Israel in, in, in general. I mean, what's the distinction here? Um, you know, there's the Zionists. I mean, if we could just kind of have like a, a conversation about that. Well, Zionists are, you know, are certainly pro you know, reestablishing Zion in the Middle East. Um, talking about 
all Jews being blamed for the action of some. If you look, stand back dispassionately and look at the United States from outside the country and you see Obama doing terrible things, then are you going to say all Americans are bad because of what Obama and the CIA or NSA do in, in the name of the United States? No. If you're being honest about it, uh, you know, not all Americans, in fact, nowhere near a majority of them at all, are bad guys supporting what's happening in, in the in the White House, uh, you know, and the various uh, three-letter agencies that uh, work for him. Um, so when you look at Zionism, you're looking at uh, the return to Mount Zion, which, you know, is the, where they call the Temple Mount, but actually the Temple Mount is part of um, the old Roman garrison that was there at the time of Christ, and the actual Temple Mount is under a bunch of uh, dirt and rubbish at the southeast corner there. Um, but that's another story anyway. So there are people who say they are Jews, and, uh, you know, technically they follow the Jewish religion, but they are not really the Orthodox uh, Jewish community. Um, how you tell the difference between them is kind of hard for me to, to put into words, but um, I suppose you do it by the actions they take. Um, there are some people that say that Netanyahu is a bad dude because he's you know part of the Zionist uh, movement, um, and you know members of various organizations uh, that are Jewish, same thing. At this point, all I can say is that I personally will support. The House of Israel, wherever they are, whether they be in Israel or they be in New York State or South America, whatever, and when they need help and I can't help them, I will do so. Holly and I both agreed to that a long time ago, uh, mainly the children who are not quite as political as parents would be, no matter what their their uh, political situation uh, is in their mind. But um, the, the, the Balfour... Declaration and the the British partitioning of the Middle East after the war laid the groundwork for a terrible, terrible conflict and probably the last, if not the next to last, big global war to unify the people, the countries of the of the planet that survived that into one government, one economy run by a single individual with three advisors close enough to him they can kill him if he steps out of line that's the the, the original um, protocols of, of, of zion you know the elders of zion type of document um, blueprint for the world and it's certainly following that but i don't think that that's a jewish conspiracy i think it's a a zionist as opposed to jewish conspiracy and a zionist can be a baptist a catholic or nothing you know, religion wise Anyway, that's just okay. my, my opinion on it. Uh, I appreciate that because it, uh, it, it seems like, um, and I don't know, it almost seems cyclical. I, I'll get emails um, from people saying, uh, oh, you know, you support the Jews. And, of course, the, they'll take the, the word Jews and uh, make it a very long you know, word. And, and you see this on on comment sections of websites and I just I, I, I just I, I see this building and building and building uh, this this uh, to me it's it's uh, ign- a lot of ignorance and stuff so I'm glad you made that uh, it is ignorance it's, it's not stupidity it's ignorance of there you the go. facts yeah, yeah you know and and, and sadly there's a, a great shortage of, of uh, historical documentation for people to see they don't dig really hard to see what's behind all this um, you know, those of us that support the real Hebrew, you know, the house of Israel, as opposed to just uh, the tribe of Judah or Benjamin, you know, because they, they, they lump everybody as Jews who are uh, members of the 12 tribes. But in essence, there are 12, well, 13 tribes of Israel uh, in the earth today. And they are... The, the orthodox ones, uh, you know, are observant and uh, observe the dietary laws and observe the 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 the, um, the seder of of a number of things, you know, the order of things in the, in the synagogue and in their community, um, and they have minimal political, you know, activities. And certainly, there are a lot of them in uh, Israel, and they tend to cluster together in tight little communities. But then there are others who say they are Jewish, but they don't practice their religion. They're not observant, and they're more political. They're more Zionist, if you wish. Um, and and those tar and feather the rest of us that have Jewish blood, 
you know, or like Hebrew blood in the, of the 13 tribes, who have nothing to do with this grand global you know, conspiracy to form a one world government uh, that's a dictatorship. Uh, you know, I, I can't argue with those people who say the Protocols of Zion later blueprint out that's being followed to the letter here in the world, and we're going to see this global dictatorship form. I cannot argue with that. But what I can argue with this is this. The Protocols of Zion, that, that, that document was a spurious document aimed to, to turn the people who understood what it said against all Jews, all Hebrews, against the House of Israel, wherever they are. And it was so obviously written to do that that it was it was a, a fake document. And again, you know, people who are grounded in history will read it and say, "Ah, all Jews are bad because of this," and will not understand that this was set up to hang the Jewish community uh, to blame them uh, in error. You know, uh, you know, it, it, it's happening. That that blueprint is happening, but it's not the Jewish community doing it. And uh, if there are some people involved in it at a high level who, who claim to be Jewish uh, bloodline, okay, <laughs> they don't represent the rest of us that have Jewish blood. Okay, uh, and, and and you know I I respect you so much. Uh, I respect your research, your opinions. You're you're very well informed about this. And, and folks, um, you could take what Stan is saying really to the bank. In my view, uh, whether it be informed speculation, fact, or whatever, I I just I, you know, just to talk about this, um, because this bothers me so much. And I also think, Stan, whether it's – it's kind of like the Pope, too, um, uh, praying in the, in the mosque and, and then the what we saw in the National Cathedral recently. If you look at what's happening, if you look at the attacks on the Jews, if you look at the attacks on the uh, on the on Christianity and on Christians, and even uh, – and. I, I want to do this very carefully. If you look at the, uh, well, how Islam is perceived, right or wrong, okay, incorrect or incorrect, I believe all of this combined is going to facilitate the creation of a state religion or a one-world religion, ultimately. Don't you think so? I mean, oh, absolutely. Without doubt. Without doubt. I mean, a former prime minister, you know, uh, Shimon Peres gets together with the Pope and, they, and says to the Pope, let's form a global religion so that, you know, the Jews and the Catholics and the Muslims can all be happy together. When they get together and say that in the news openly, you know it's coming. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, folks, let me just say this. If you, if you don't have a copy, as we get close to uh, when Christians normally celebrate uh, uh, Christmas, if you don't have a copy of Holly Dale's book, Dare to Prepare, uh, the, the, the uh, CD as well. As, and, and, of course, Cosmic Conspiracy. Man, Cosmic Conspiracy is a great book. It's a great read, and it's a great reference book. So uh, please add that to your Christmas shopping list, standale.com, under, uh, under the book section there, please. Um, they, plus, that, uh, that supports Stan's work and Holly's work as well. Plus, you get a great Deal. So I just wanted to toss that out there because I, uh, Stan, I got to tell you, um, the, the, there's two people that are going to be getting there to prepare. Just got to warn you. So you know, in case you get a flood of two uh, two orders here in the next uh, few days. <laughs> well, it's all welcome. I'll tell you, since the economy is taking a downturn, a lot of us in the uh, Christian ministry, you know, books and publications have noticed a, a drop of somewhere between 50 and 75 percent of people coming to our sites. You know, and, and getting our products and reading them. So we know that that uh, the time must be getting close because we're just getting squeezed out. Interesting. Um, well, interesting you brought that up because I've got a Jonathan who is in Alaska right now, listening live, just outside of Anchorage, wanting to know if if your website has experienced any type of either denial of service attacks or, and, and this is really what he's asking here, um, the the way search engines handle. The uh, your website, your news articles, your books, or whatever it might be. Have you noticed a? De well, you have obviously noticed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you attribute some of that to maybe um, internal machinations of the search Google engines? or something? Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I don't. Know. I don't know. It. It certainly would be easy for them to do. Uh, and you've seen how uh, you know Google and. 
you know, Facebook and Yahoo, all these things are being centralized into, you know, the hands of a very small group of people, a small cadre. And um, they certainly don't like us uh, that are uh, Christian uh, witnesses, um, especially, you know, the uh, fundamentalist uh, approach. We are the enemy and growing so every day. Um, but I can't, I can't tell you, I, I don't know what's caused it, but I can tell you that a number of us, uh, names uh, other, uh, you know, uh, Christian outreach ministers that you would know. I, I, I won't just say the, all their names just for, you know, being polite. But we've all talked and noticed uh, since about March of this year huge drops in sales. I mean, huge drops and ministries uh, that uh, depended on donations uh, as well as book sales. They have noticed huge drops in the giving. And I I can't blame that on denial of service because I think it's just people being broke. Um, this administration is killing our ability to even survive. And um, so all these things add up, maybe some denial of service, some misrouting of people, but also the economy in general is hurting uh, the the support of the various ministries that depend on that, uh, and ours included. I, I'm, I'm not uh, denying that, but... Um, at least, you know, we aren't being shot in the back of the head in a ditch somewhere. I mean, not yet, anyway. Um, I was just going to say, not yet. Well, well, yesterday over in Kenya, uh, there, you know, the uh, the Shahab militants there, who are like, you know, kind of terrorists in their own right. Um, they uh, they're Somalis, uh, and and they came into Kenya there, and they killed. 36 miners, uh, they, they rounded up all the mine workers and they took them over, you know, away from the mine and they, they put about 36, of them, which is, I think, somewhere half, near the half of them, uh, and they were non-Muslims. And they just laid them in the ditch, shot them in the head or cut their heads off, just killed them just outright there because, you know, of the the, the, the Muslim agenda there, or the extreme Muslim agenda there. Um, so, that's we're not seeing that here yet, but we are certainly being pinched economically uh, in the United States, which is, you know, for 50, 60, 70 years been a, a great, probably the, the, the leading Christian evangelical outreach for the world. But now then, uh, you know, the time is coming to a close. They're shutting us down. And uh, I sometimes wonder if we're going to get that knock at the door where they knock the front door in while we're sleeping and come and march us off, and that'll be the end of it for us anyway. Uh, every time these these black helicopters come over the house of late, they're coming down real low and shaking the windows when they come over. Um, you wonder if they're going to drop troops out right on your house, and, and uh, that'll be the end of you. But uh, we're still doing what we were meant to do, and uh, I'm sure that a lot of the other Wow. Uh, evangelical people like yourself and, you know, uh, L.A. and all kinds of us are, are feeling this pinch. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. And, and, folks, I mean, that's that's just a fact. I mean, I, I've talked to enough people uh, like Stan has, too, and the, well, the remarks, the comments, the assessments have been the same, and it's been, it's been very rough. Um, there's an L.J. listening uh, who wants to know um, if you think, um, Stan, and, and you said I haven't heard Stan talk about this. Uh, do you think, Stan, and this kind of segues into what we're talking about too, uh, can they shut down the Internet? I, I mean, uh, there's obviously controls that um, they can implement, but, but would they shut it down completely? Well, they might uh, shut down the Internet that we know, and, and they might give you some warning because they want to have an Internet that it has more electronic control in it, uh, you know, so that they can have the cashless society and stuff working. Um, and th th that alternate Internet, I'm sure they've already got that uh, laid out and uh, tested it with the new supercomputer over in Utah and other places because they have uh, backup computers all over the planet linked together. And that, well, yeah, they could shut it down. They wouldn't shut it down just, I don't think, just kabang, unless it were due to some EMP or some military action. In that case, 
well, that, that's war, and uh, things would change drastically suddenly here and abroad. But they would try, since this is a global um, communications and, and economic network, they would try to shift the people, all of us, from our dependence on the old Internet onto the new one. You'd have to load your files over. They would do it for you onto the new Internet, which would be totally controlled. And if they didn't like you, you would disappear. I mean, your, your site would disappear off the Internet or the new Internet. So I think they could do that. Okay. Yeah. That, that, makes, uh, that makes perfect sense. Um, a, a Bruce T. writing, and this again, it seems like these these questions are all kind of pretty close together. Wants to know if you heard of something called Operation Cleaver, and and uh, apparently there was a, a, a report released. I guess it was today. Let me. I'm looking at looking at his. Did you see the name was then? Operation Cleaver. Cleaver. Yeah, uh, apparently there was a report that was released today where Iranian state-sponsored hackers have been singled out for attacks on critical infrastructures worldwide, including 10 targets in the United States. Have you heard anything about this? Well, not by the name Cleaver, but that doesn't mean it's not you know a hot topic somewhere. I, I, there's so many uh, articles at the moment on the attacks on the U.S., you know, internet uh, system that, uh, and you know, the financial system which depends on it. That I'm sure I could have missed it. But I, yeah, I, I've never heard of this either. But apparently, the uh, the, the crux of of the the topic here is that Iran is being blamed. Iran is is uh, apparently there there have been hackers or the hacking operations uh, that are. Attacking global interests well beyond the United States and Israel, but uh, specifically um, hitting critical infrastructures, well, on a global level, but specifically in the United States and Israel. And people are the security companies that monitor this and do all this, whatever, are blaming Iran. And apparently, now some. Um, uh, okay, a Reuters article quoted a senior Iranian, Iranian official who dismissed the report, saying that this is a baseless, baseless and unfounded allegation fabricated to tarnish Iranian government's image and uh, is particularly aimed at hampering current nuclear talks. So it kind of all kind of fits together. Thank you, Bruce T., for that question. Uh, so, so there it is. Um, you know, apparently there's some stuff hitting our critical infrastructures and uh, yeah. Iran is being blamed. And I have an well, update, Stan. Iran, say again? Uh, I just wanted to, I have an update about the story that you brought, you opened with, not to interrupt your thought process here on Iran, but about the uh, several sonic bo uh, booms or the loud noises. It, uh, yeah. Somebody, uh, Kevin, thanks Kevin, sent me an article, um, Navy takes responsibility for several uh, recent sonic booms. The Navy, um, I'll put this in your Skype too, Stan, um, it says that they confirmed Tuesday the Naval Air Station uh, caused three of five recent sonic booms. That's the Pat Patanuex River uh, station that caused several sonic booms, they say. And I'll throw this to you in your uh, Skype chat right. so you can check it out and, and read it. And sorry for interrupting you on your thought process and on Iran. Well, you know, kind of related to that, a uh, derivative of this uh, this hacking business. Um, I've been thinking about you know the bank closures that uh, you know are looming. That's probably you know near clear and present, near danger to to everyone. And we've got, you know, people have got money in the bank. Uh, some have got savings, some have got checking accounts. Um, and some people have got cash, you know, stuffed under the mattress or some gold and some silver. Now, when the banks get a hit to the point where they, they close and, you know, they say, look, we're going to have to shut down the accounts. And when we come back, you know, you'll have maybe 10% of the the, the, the 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 value you had before. But instead of having normal money, if you've got money on the mattress, you're going to have to turn it in at the the uh, the new rate, which might be only 10% of what you had before. And uh, to do that and get your your money back, you're going to have to take the number. Uh, so you can't buy or sell anything, including gold. You know, you, you if you trade gold to somebody, you're going to have to trade it for an object, and then they're going to have to report where they got the gold eventually. 
So having cash under the mattress, having um, all your bills paid, having gold and silver, they're only going to help you just momentarily as the, the banking system collapses and we go to this worldwide um, numbering system. And, uh, you know, this is what I'm more concerned with at the moment than the hacking of the accounts and, you know, uh, uh, that's happening by Iran or whatever. I think the globalists have got the, the plan is about to happen, about to come to fruition, where suddenly people will panic because they can't get cash out of the bank, just like happened in Greece. They can't bring their cash into the bank because the banks are either shutting or not allowing them to, to deposit. So they're going to have to you know, use cash until it's gone very quickly. And uh, again, it will buy you know a lot less than it did before. I mean, if you had ten grand socked away somewhere, it might only buy a thousand dollars worth of the new currency uh, and with the devalued U.S. dollar. So these things are, are really clear and present dangers in my mind, uh, which will hit everybody in the pocketbook, uh, whether we have a war or not. This this is an economic situation, a crisis, a catastrophic thing that will make people just force them into accepting the new world economy, and hence the new world government, to survive. They'll lose their houses, they'll, they'll lose their cars, uh, you know, uh, they can't eat without it. And that might be part of the famine that comes, too, even to America, when people can't afford the food because its main, main part of it's being imported and, and uh, with foreign dollars being higher value than our U.S. dollars, they won't be able to afford as much food. There's just a lot of things like this that are all tied together, this... You know, gosh. <laughs> you, you, you know, you can almost feel it, see it, and touch it. You know, it, it's all coming together. Uh, and, and, I, and I know people are very perceptive, and they can feel that there's something just so wrong out there. True. And, you know, um, and, and especially the, the closer you get to God and prayer, you, you, the better understanding you have. So, uh, yeah, I... I'm very concerned about the economy or the economic uh, situation because, man, once that falls, once that goes, um, aside from the anarchy and chaos, what uh, what will replace it is going to be perhaps, <laughs> by orders of magnitude, much worse and much more deadly to Christians. So, oh, absolutely, and, and, and look, when it comes, I mean. This is why, you know, a number of us, you know, like, like Holly's book, you know, that different fair thing, why they say, okay, um, you can prepare so much for your home where you are, wherever that is, you know, to, to endure these things. But in the end, you're going to have to uh, leave your home and to take what you can on your back or in your vehicle if you've got one that, that's, you know, paid for or whatever, uh, to get out of town because uh, they're going to say you need to pay land taxes, you need to pay this and that, but you have to have a, a you know a digital account. No cash will do, and that's when you got to take the mark of the new world order. And that to me is you know the Bible says don't do it, and, and this is going to be a hard thing for people to walk away from what they've worked a lifetime to save. Um, you know, I just this Ferguson thing is another thing that's thrown a you know, an iron in the fire. Uh, it's going to create more and more tensions between various racial groups, religious groups here. And when it all starts to erupt, people are going to start to loot. You, you saw a minor example of that by the the, the communist, uh, you know, instigators in Ferguson and in uh, in uh, California over the Ferguson event, you know, starting to loot. They just break down the windows of the stores and steal. And that that'll that'll expand to people that are known to have prepared so it is going to be a very, very volatile time, and I do hope and pray that the rapture comes right at the beginning of that for the church, and they can have our resources then because we're gone. You know, it's we're we're, we're seeing that real quick. Yeah, uh, I, I I I cannot believe the news. You know how quickly the news is, is being. Um, uh, we're we're seeing. It, it, it's almost like we could catch a new headline every hour, whereas five years ago it might have been every five or six hours. It's just everything has been speeding up so much. Well, we've uh, been saying, you know, uh, look out, it's coming, it's coming, and now then we're saying, duck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I, one more question from a listener because uh, we, we've had some people on, 
And it's been interesting because we've had uh, people from uh, talking to us from Costa Rica and people talking to us from, uh, to us from various other Central American countries. Uh, and so um, let me see who's this from. Uh, Millie, I'm just going to say Millie. Uh, Millie wants to know, Stan and Holly, do you have any inclination to leave the country? Because you've been essentially, you know, you've lived in other parts of the world. Would you? Is there any inclination for you to leave America? Uh, yeah, actually, um, I'm looking for the off ramp for planet Earth. I want to get out of the whole planet. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, send um, I know what she's asking. <laughs> yeah, I will. Uh, well, that's um, that's the rapture business, you know. We know that. Um, look, Christians are not really citizens of Earth. Their kingdom is not of Earth. It is with the Lord, wherever that kingdom is, and uh, we are sojourners here. And uh, our passports are to a, another country. Now, as far as living outside the United States, the United States, even 30 years ago, uh, even 20 years ago when I was in Australia, um, the the Americans are called the Yanks, you know, in a lot of places, most places outside the country. And we are blamed for all kinds of things. And because of the actions of our government and various three-letter agencies, when I was down in Australia, there was always this kind of sideways humor. You know, that people would say, uh, "Yeah, you're, you're CIA down here. We know that. You know, Americans are all CIA and they're rich and whatever." And, and this is the common conception. And uh, when Holly and I had prepared down there on our farm in Victoria, we had a, a, a particular tradesman that did some work for us, and he got to see some of what we had there in storage. And he says, you know, I'm not worried about getting prepared. I, I know where you are. I'll come and get some from you when I need it. And they're not talking friendly like. They're talking they're going to come and, and knock you over the head if you don't share. And and you're uh, once the American economy collapses and America can't, uh, it can't defend its people overseas, then the Americans are like lepers overseas. And they're fair game for any country and the people in any country they're in. And people will justify immediately like a lynch mob, take the American what they've got because they stole it from the rest of us. That's the mentality that's out there. So do I, do I want to leave the country? Am I looking at it? No. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal here with the people and terrain and circumstances and culture that I know, and I'll take my chances here rather than having no friends and, uh, and only foreigners, and, and in a lot of cases that don't even speak the same language, uh, around me. You know, because uh, that's just silly. It, it's you got to you got to go where your assets are the best, and it's being among the cultures we we have here. Even if you have to go bush here, you know, walk about and 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 go out into the desert. The good Lord will tell you where. I'm sure tell all of us where to go. But uh, it will be uh, more prudent to do that here than in any other foreign country. You know, it's just. <laughs> And I say any other, meaning that America is a foreign country for us as well, because we're not part of right. We're, we're part right. of the heavenly kingdom. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know what, Stan? I don't think. Um, and, and Millie, thank you uh, very much. By the way, that's not her real name, and she just wrote down. Uh, or she sent me another email saying, "Tell Stan." Uh, this is the the first time she's heard you, and uh, uh, visited your website. And of course, she said. Uh, I'm going to be ordering your book and Holly. So uh, thank you, Millie. But uh, yeah. not, thank you, Millie. Not your real name. But but yeah, I don't think Christians can can uh, we as Christians we're not going to run. We can't run from what's coming. I don't. Think, I mean, you know, where are you going to go? And you're right. Um, but yeah, it's a supernatural uh, warfare as well. I mean, it's uh, it's yeah. a you know we're only going to have to uh, we're going to have to keep our our hearts and our uh, relationship with the Lord open because we're only going to be able to go where he tells us to go and we're only going to be safe if we are listening to what he tells us and we're only going to be hearing him if the communication is open so you know regardless of what people want to do in their minds without uh, talking to the Lord about it uh, this is something that the Lord needs to be first and foremost in the discussions when, when we're dealing with this Joseph and Mary, after Jesus was born, Joseph was approached by an angel in a dream that told him, quick, wake up, get your family, and head over to Egypt. Okay? 
Now, before that time, Joseph wasn't thinking about taking his business and uprooting it and wandering off to some other foreign country. My point is, is that the the good Lord, like you said, uh, uh, Joe, will tell his people where they need to be, when they need to be, and what they need to take. And you just got to be ready to abandon a lot of the stuff you've put together if the Lord calls you to do that. Um, you know, it's hard. Uh, it's hard to walk out the door and say, I'm not coming back, and I've got what's on my back. I have done that before. And so in that respect, I, I know what it's like to be, you know, a leper in the community and to, to go underground, as it were. I had to do that in Australia many years ago. And uh, so I know you can do it. And one of the things I noticed, believe it or not, was the less things I had to worry about, you know, protecting, the the better I felt the morning I got up. It was like, hey, I'd be like, I don't worry. You know, that nobody's going to knock me over the head for what I don't have. You know, it's uh, – anyway, I – I, I, I totally understand that, that feeling, that mindset, and uh, I couldn't imagine uh, when uh, – that. I suppose that's a case when assets become liabilities. Um, you, you know, if if, if you got to worry about your Picasso hanging in the, in the hallway or your Bentley in the garage or, or your gold in your safe or whatever, then, yeah, that's a problem. Um, yeah. The good Lord will provide what we need, I'm sure of that. And look, um, it will be different for each of us, I'm sure. But uh, we will be part of the bride, the body. And whether there's a rapture at that time or whether it's, uh, the Lord uh, tarries a bit and it's, we go into the tribulation period of a few weeks or days or months or whatever, I know it, that he will take care of what we need. He's done it for me. I've seen it and you know, experienced it firsthand, just miracle after miracle. And, of course, the scoffers can say, oh, well, those were coincidences. But <laughs> when I add them all up, there's just too many of them that happen at the right time and the right place. And so I know it will happen for the church. We know better. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, yeah. We've seen it, you know, working. Yeah, there, are in, people, in... there are people that. Sorry, go, go on, uh, Joe. I just said, oh, there we've are people seen it we've working in our lives, just as well as, you know, you say you have uh, the living examples, you know. Uh, our show yep. and 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 just everything that has been put in our lives is a living example of how the Lord works uh, in our in our lives, uh, whether we notice it or but not. But you got to listen, you know. You got to listen. You you got you got to have you got to pray and listen. I, you know. You know. I mean, that's it, the hardest times in my life, uh, Stan, have been when I refuse to listen or obey. And I, so, listening and being obedient are two key factors, I believe, um, in, in the prayer cycle or in the prayer. Room, yeah, and sometimes uh, you know you think it's it's counterintuitive what what the the spirit nudges you to do, but um, uh, you know like when Holly and I you know prayed about where we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to, be, we live down on a farm in Australia. I mean, we could shut the doors, the gates to the farm, and live a year without seeing another person outside the farm. We were that well set up down there, but yet you know in a dream vision that I could not ignore. The Lord even showed me a view from the, this office where I am now out the window of a place I'd never seen, of a town I'd never been to in the United States, you know, half a planet away, and said, you know, go there. And uh, so we did. And, of course, we've been able to, to have the ministry we've had because of that. But it was not easy. We had to, to take great losses financially just to do that. But uh, you'll know, and yeah. uh, it'll be your choice do what the, the Spirit urges you to do. Amen, Stan. We want to thank you for your time, and we want to thank uh, Holly also for what the work you guys both do together, separately together, and uh, for being a regular guest and a friend of this show. We can't thank you enough and, and tell you how honored and blessed we are to, to have this relationship with you, and I know our audience appreciates it, and we do too, and it's been another great week, well, Stan. Well, guys. Well, we, uh, all right, guys. Let's hope we get another one, Lord willing. Amen. Amen. We're going to keep you in our prayers. We're going to keep Holly in our prayers. And you guys uh, stay warm and stay out of trouble up there, okay? If you insist. <laughs> all right. <laughs> you God, too, guys. Night, God night, bless night. you. All right. God bless you. Bye-bye. Folks, that was uh, Mr. Stan Dale, the real Indiana Jones, I like to call him, because um, I, I remember listening to uh, Art Bell, hearing him on Art Bell and thinking, 
wow, what a, what, just what a great intellectual mind um, uh, Mr. Deo has. And, of course, you know, uh, just how well-grounded he is in Holly. And yeah. They're, they're you know, fantastic. Look at us now, what, 15, 20 years later, uh, after you waking me up before school to listen to Coast to <laughs> Coast with people like Stan on it. Yeah. Here we are with our own show, uh, having the uh, ability and the blessings to be able to interview these same people who we were once looking up to, listening to, and, uh, you know, hoping to. still look up to, you know, and uh, we don't really deserve to even be in their shadow half, uh, really. I mean, they're just fantastic people. Uh, Go ahead, Joe. With that, we're going to take the top of the hour break. We're going to come back with your phone calls at 661-244-9839. That's 661-244-9839. Your phone calls, other news as well. Uh, if we have time, we'll see how it goes. We'll be right back after these short messages. Ladies and gentlemen, to our third and final hour, actually our third and final 42 minutes of the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Tuesday, December 2nd, 2014. I want to wish a happy birthday to my sister, Julie. I know she's not listening, but we're going to wish her my a happy daughter. birthday anyway. Uh, and that's why we didn't do it at the beginning of the show, because we know she probably wasn't tuning in. But uh, I'm going to tell her we wished her a happy birthday during some point of the show and ask her to come back with a time when we did so. Uh, you hear that, Julie? So you're going to listen for a while uh, before you get that happy birthday. <laughs> no, but seriously, happy birthday, Julie. Hope you had a great day. Um, with that, we should open the phones uh, and go to the callers. We have some callers in queue, and if you want to join in, the number is 661-244-9839. We're going to go... And, and Joe, Joe's making me wear mittens so I can't touch anything. <laughs> We're going to go to area code 774 first. 774, you're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. What's on your mind? Hello? 774? Hello? All right. Hello? You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. And that was dropped off. All right. 562, 562. You're up next. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. What's on your mind tonight? That's you, Janet. That's you, Janet. There you go. <laughs> talk to us. Come on. Five, Come on. Six, talk eight. to us. You can do it. <laughs> Anybody. No, you're okay. Doug and Joe, this is, this is Rick. I'm Janet's husband. And I just want to say that she loves she loves you guys, and uh, we sometimes get the cue without touching it. I don't know what happens, but but this is the second time this has happened. And I just want to say that we appreciate you guys. We love the Lord pray Jesus. We pray for you. We got your sticker on our car, and uh, uh, hang in there, guys. We love you. <laughs> oh, well, thanks. Cool. That's great. God bless you. Thanks. Oh yeah, we, we ordered the sweatshirt. Too. She's getting the sweatshirt. Yeah, I love it. Awesome. I listen every night. And I know you love the Lord, and we love the Lord Jesus so much. So God bless you, and we will continue to. I always think, oh, I'd love to call him, get too nervous. So I guess the Lord wanted me to say this. Well, thank you guys. Well, uh, appreciate it. For everything, for the the bumper stickers promoting the show, uh, through the stickers, through the shirts. I hope you guys really enjoy them. And if there's anything we can ever do for you guys, give us a call. Uh, Okay. Wash your car, wash your dishes, <laughs> scrub your floors, just let okay. us know. We will All right. see you. Okay. Thanks have a so good much night. for your call. Bye-bye. Wow. All right. We have 774 back. We're going to try and go back All to right. them. 774, we're coming back to you. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. And there's nobody there. I don't know if there's a mute uh, issue on your end, caller. But I'm going to put you back on hold. We will try to come back to you. We're going to go to area code 423 next. 423, you're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought this was Chris Matthews. Oh, <laughs> uh, wait a second. Let, let me get Hi, Chris. Uh, he's, 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 Chris is... Um, Disposal. Well, no, I, I was going to say something, but I, I, I dare not. Go ahead. No, I use just uh he's he's <laughs> yeah. just with uh uh Obama and, and never mind. Dad, go ahead, buddy. <laughs> oh, I'm just listening. You know, uh every night I I sit here and uh around this time of night, you know, I'm doing 
the chores and stuff with the kids. You all pretty much came like a part of our family, and uh, I've always got you on. You know, it just beeps me over to you. I don't really hit nothing, but you know, I listen to you every night. But you know, I love everything you guys do. I appreciate it. And, but well, uh, appreciate you. Appreciate you appreciating us. We yeah. appreciate being appreciated. Well, <laughs> it's appreciated. And we appreciate the help, uh, Tommy. You've helped get some, some guests on for us, and uh, uh, that's been uh, uh, very fruitful, and we, we appreciate that. And, uh, and you li- and you're well, listening. I was, well, I was addicted to the hokey pokey, but I've turned myself around, so. <laughs> oh, that's what it's all about, buddy. I'm sure that's what you're waiting for. Oh, well, thanks for being uh, but I appreciate it. You guys have a good night. Yeah, you too. God bless you, too, my friend. God bless. All right. Wow. All right. Yeah. Let's go to area uh, code. Wait, before you go to this, and I, I'm sorry, caller, I just want to get this in here before, um, uh, in case you haven't seen this. I just got an email from Steve Quayle, who, um, uh, before it's news, Oath Keepers surrounded by 50 per- for, yeah, 50 Ferguson police officers stopped defending these buildings. Now, um, this is on Before Snooze, and I heard some rumblings about this over the past couple of days. And uh, I, I do know that we've had Stuart Rhodes on our program before, and I knew that he was expected in Ferguson today. Yeah. To, uh, the liaison. I heard they were going to go there to protect. Uh, and really? try to restore order for business owners that would uh, or needed their services. Now, we saw, we watched a video, and we mentioned this yesterday a little bit, uh, kind of inconclusive, but seemed to show a would be SWAT team or a uh, other governmental agency dressed in SWAT team as it was not color coded or uh, specified as to the jurisdiction on the uniforms, but. Uh, starting what would be a fire in a car, which was in a uh, business parking lot that later engulfed the whole store. Now, we know the Department of Justice has sent protest uh, teams down there. We know that there are other government agencies at work here doing many different exercises from uh, the DOD and their civil disturbance uh, you know, exercises to the DHS and their uh, domestic extremist exercises, as well as all the other ones far and few in between. Um, right, right. Um, moving quickly here, I, I want to mention this, and this from Lisa. It, it always, it, it breaks my it, it breaks my heart when I get emails like this. It really does. Uh, Lisa writes, um, and I'm not going to give up any personal information, so don't, don't worry. Um, Hi, Doug and Joe. I just wanted to thank you for standing up for Christ and being watchmen. Your program has led me to my husband, led me and my husband to be closer to Christ. It's helped me uh, to keep my husband on the straight and narrow. Um, she writes, uh, and I'm going through some sentences here. She writes, I also wanted to ask for your prayers for my friend Shannon. Now, Shannon has a seven month seven-month-old named Nora is suffering from the beginning stages of heart failure at seven months. She's losing weight and her blood pressure is high. Shannon, of course, is just worried and absolutely heartbroken. Her husband, Robbie, is beginning to lose faith. And they've got two other girls to look after Maddie and Layla. And God does heal, and I, and I trust that He will heal Nora. I just want to. Um, I just want as many true Christians as possible to be praying for them. So, folks, if you can, if you will, please pray for Nora, a seven-month-old suffering from the beginning stages of heart failure. She's losing weight. Her blood pressure is high. Pray for not only Nora, but Shannon. 
Nora's mother, Robbie, Nora's father, and Nora's sisters, Maddie and Layla. Pray for absolute healing. Yeah. And, and I just wanted to make sure, please, folks, when you hit your knees tonight, keep them in your prayers. Absolutely. All right, we'll go back to the phones. We're going to go to area code 786. 786, you're up next. You are live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Hey, Doug. Hey, Joe. How are you guys doing tonight? Fantastic. How are you? Oh, doing good. Great to uh, be able to talk to you guys again. Uh, Lord's been moving me to uh, uh, talk with you guys, but one thing or another, either y'all have had guests and not been taking calls on a lot of the shows, um, and or uh, some, you know, with the holidays, you know, things come up. But uh, he's really been uh, moving me to uh, get back in touch with you guys. I talked with y'all week before last about, you know, uh, after uh, Obama, you know, signed the executive order for amnesty and how serious a situation uh, with him is. Um, but first of all, before uh, uh, state well, uh, the Lord's wanted me to state tonight. Uh, definitely, we all need to pray uh, I, for that little seven-year-old Nora. Uh, it breaks my the heart. Seven I month have yeah. seven-month-old. Seven I'm sorry. Um, that uh, I, I, part of me just wants to get angered that probably somewhere along the way, because of the food and what they're doing with the environment and the chemtrails and the GMO, uh, somewhere somewhere along the way, uh, those uh satanic luciferian uh rulers of this world somehow you know caused that to happen somewhere along the way in in their attack on our dna over the last several generations and i just want to get so upset but uh she's in lord's hands and we all just need to pray for that family and uh, pray for a breakthrough and a miracle and and that uh uh you know that the Lord sees, you know, sees her through that. Um, but uh, I just, I get so angry when I hear of the children that are. There's so many children nowadays uh, showing up in these uh, children hospitals with all sorts of deformities and all sorts of problems. And um, I have a son uh, who has Downs, and he was in the uh, NICU. Um, uh, and for six weeks, and just the number of children with the, the oddest defects in their bodies being born broken, it's just heartbreaking uh, that these 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 Satanists are just just taking just an awful toll on us, and it just seems like we all still just stand there and. I know it's in the Lord's hands, but, you know, you just want to do something to stop these. Um, well, I'm not going to use the language I would like to use against right. these people, but, but you know what I'm saying. I've just, uh, uh, I ask the Lord to, to temper my anger when, whenever I think about what they've done to the children in this country and around the world with the different uh, modes of, uh, and the different weapons that they have at their disposal from the fallen angel technology over the centuries. But... Uh, I, the Lord really moved me in the last couple of weeks to, uh, to talk to you guys. Um, I know that there's always debate uh, going on, on in your chat room and, uh, and also online. And uh, uh, I know where uh, Sheila and many of the guests and Pastor Linkford and Steve Quill, uh, uh, you know, their their view on um you know the pre tribulation rapture and uh but there's still so many uh, in the chat room and so many that listen that still believe in and I, I'm gonna say this word but and I know it's kinda of strong but it is a heresy. Um if you could, uh Doug or Joe, uh could you uh open your Bibles to Revelation chapter fourteen please? I got it. Okay, great. Revelation Could you read? chapter 14, I'm here, okay. Okay, it's talking about the 144,000 Jewish men, 12,000, they're virgin Jewish men uh, that are, uh, they're called back in, I believe, uh, chapter 4 of Revelations. They're 12,000 out of each tribe, 
and they're virgins, and uh, they follow the yeah. land wherever they go. There are 144,000 uh, that it were which were redeemed from the earth. These were they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. These were them redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. Right. That there, if anybody still believes in the pre trib rapture, God showed that to me actually several months back. Yeah, but he and and uh when I've called you guys before I've uh some other subject was being talked about and I never uh never did uh relay this on to you. But anybody who uh will read that and knows about the first fruits of God that goes back to the Old Testament, the first fruits, those are the first that 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 are called are those hundred forty four thousand and um I know that like the Jehovah Witnesses take it and they spin it off into their own thing, but I'm not talking from a Jehovah Witness there. I'm not a Jehovah Witness. But those hundred and forty four thousand men are the first fruits. Nobody can go before the first fruits are taken. And and that chapter fourteen is after chapter thirteen, which is the uh, where the Antichrist is revealed and the mark is put into place. So all Christians that are alive when the Antichrist shows up, they're not going to, we're not going to be taken out before that happens. Oh. Now, if you, when you read on in chapter 14, it starts talking about the angels announcing the judgment of God. Now we're going into the great tribulation of God and in his actual judgments. But just knowing about first fruits, uh, nobody else can go before those 144,000. I mean, to me, that should be case closed that there's no pre tribulation rapture. And anybody, it, and I'm kind of surprised, I, I, and maybe I've just missed a show where one of your guests have talked about it, but I've just been surprised that nobody's actually talked about that angle that how can anybody go before those first fruits? And well, uh, and there in go ahead. Caller, if I can, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a, a point here. From what I read okay. uh, here about the 144,000, it says these were men which were not defiled by women. They were uh, redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God, unto the Lamb. And it starts with that verse 14, 4. It says, and these are they which were not defiled. And it goes on to say in verse three, in the in the second part of that verse, it says. But the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth, um, that goes on to, to mean that were redeemed to be purchased or to be um, redeemed, bought by the Lord. The first fruits, if I am correct in my biblical interpretation, were those that were in Abraham's bosom, which was resurrected when the Lord was crucified uh, himself. Those were the first fruits um, were, were from the when, when the Lord was crucified. And from Adam uh, up until, you know, uh, from Moses to Abraham to John the Baptist, anybody who died in Christ before the Lord was, was crucified went up to heaven when he went up to heaven after his resurrection. And I well, yeah, I be, agree with that. Are, are you saying that this is referring back to those, those people just... Yes, the first first fruits, and I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying, from what I understand, the first fruits are those that were taken from the Abraham's bosom at the resurrection of the Lord into heaven with the Lord. Right. Yeah, and that, I mean that's explained in some of the extra biblical text uh, concerning how Jesus went down into uh, Hades, or people want to call hell. People get that confused with the lake of fire, but he went down and released the Old Testament prophets and and those that were uh, in chains uh, and, and and brought them up with him uh, when he conquered death and hell. And I agree with you on that. I was thinking that these, these are 144,000 that are actually on the earth around the reign of the Antichrist because it says that they follow him around um, and, and they're actually on the earth during the, the last days. Now, you're right. I agree with you. Those are first fruits, but I'm thinking that these are first fruits as far as the people who are on the earth at the time of the of the end times. That's that's what the Lord is kind of putting in my heart that when I read that 
uh, he it was just something just really it, it exploded off the page. I don't know how to really explain it. I guess y'all have had these same experiences where it's just like, well, that settles it. I mean, how can anybody go before those 144,000 because they're the first fruits? You know, God demands, you know, the first fruits, you know, going back to the, the old sacrifices, you know, during the um, Old Testament times. And um, so, I mean, there's a lot of other arguments for not having a preacher of rapture, but yeah, but, I, my... But, but Carl, if, if I can just say this, okay, and, and to me, uh, and this is Doug Hagman speaking now, and very simply put, okay, to me, as I look at this and look at the big picture of things, here's what I see. I okay. see uh, the, the, this dog or this um, dogma of pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, whatever trib. Okay, I see it as currently, currently now to, in today's environment, being absolutely divisive in terms oh, of. Okay, now having said that, here's the only thing I personally. I I would I I tend to believe based on, uh, for example, Pastor Langford's interpretations and, and others, I I personally believe it's not going to be there will be no preterb rapture. But but here's the, the golden nugget that that I really focus on. I worry I'm concerned about those who are so dogmatic about a preterb uh, rapture that. They will, their faith will be shaken in the event, or when 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 a when no rapture takes place and but it's jeopardized. And, yeah, their faith will be put right. in exactly and, jeopardy. Uh, it, it, yeah, to, to me, that's really the key, and I think that that this is part of the great deception. So that's why I tend to believe um, in a in a, in a uh, not a pre-trib rapture, because what would shake someone's faith? Um, it's kind of like waiting for a ride at the, you know, you're you're a young child, innocent, and uh, you, you know you you walk out of the school and you're standing there waiting for a ride, which never shows up or doesn't show up right away. You get scared. Yeah. You get, you know, and, and to me, that's how I I look at this. That's where the danger to me exists. Now, that's just me. That's my opinion. And in the story, but I—that's why I believe that's the only importance I put into this, uh, the, the doctrine of the rapture. Okay, the only importance I put in is the p- potential for the shaking of the faith and loss of the faith of those people right. who are so dogmatic about a preacher of rapture, and that's really all, the only thing I've got to say about it. Yeah, you can, well, you can I, do all kinds of calculations. No. So, well, I or, absolutely agree with you. I think I, exactly uh, you're right on point with that. Uh, I think it will shake a lot of people. I will just real quick uh, tell you. I don't think I don't think it was any kind of prophetic dream, but I did have a dream after reading some uh, after reading um, some of uh, Book of Matthew and uh, and uh, some of Revelation, and I had a dream not too long after I read parts of the. Uh, you know, Sermon on the Mountain, some things, um, that, you know, where Jesus says that, you know, if they tell you I'm out in the desert, don't believe it, you know, I'm I'm in the hidden place, don't believe it. And I had a yeah. dream where uh, the fallen angels, uh, the Nephilim, mainly fallen angels, as part of the great deception on those looking for a pre-tribulation rapture, would show up at people's houses and say, hey, you need to go out to the desert. It was a dream. I'm just really making it brief. It was more detailed than that. But basically, angels were uh, fallen angels were showing up as angels of light, saying, Jesus is out out here. You need to go with us. And, um, and I thought that that may be part of a, a master uh, deception uh, against people uh, on the people that are trying to isn't believe that, that there's going to be a, a secret uh, taken isn't, away. It, isn't that in the Bible, Joe? Though you know when they say you know, yes. in the desert, don't go, it's or it, out in the you know if they say I'm in a secret place here or there, do not go. If they say I'm in the desert, 
uh, do not go, for as lightning cometh out of the uh, west to the east, so too shall the coming of the uh, uh, second coming of, of the Lord be. Meaning that in the twinkling of an eye, or in an instant, we will all know when Christ is returning, as opposed to uh, some kind of secret returning in a chamber somewhere that you're trying to be lured to. Right, right. And so, uh, you know, I had I had this dream, and... Uh, that you know that that was part of the deception was and and the way that they talk about you know with these uh with these movies like left behind and those series of you know and when you hear from a lot of the pre trib uh leaders uh, uh they you know talk about it, well it's kind of a secret thing and I'm like no that's you know it's not secret and you know I don't know <laughs> like I said it was just a dream that came in out of reading you know those parts of the bible and and I thought that it was kind of uh, you know strange that uh, you know it would that I would have that kind of dream after reading that and seeing that you know Jesus is warning don't don't I'm not going to show up in some sort of secret way and it seems like that's how the pre-trib rapture kind of uh, sells itself it's going to be a secret thing and so uh, that's just something to think about something to chew on the other thing is uh, I did. The last time I talked to you, I was I, I, I kept y'all forever, and I I want I want to get off the phone here and let some other people talk. But um, as far as going back, I know thing Ebola has kind of gone off the radar, but I did want to relay over. Uh, I was talking with somebody I know that's a uh, biochemist, and uh, they this is just something to think about: is that uh, if uh, if they were trying to do uh, clinical trials uh, for a vaccine uh, for Ebola, it would be hard to find patients where they can pay $75 in gas money to participate in a, some sort of study. But if they're uh, introducing it selectively into the United States and, in, and into our um, into our genome here in the United States are kind of our specialized, you know, Americans are mixed, but but we also kind of, uh, over a couple of generations, you know, we kind of are, you know, we we got some d- different characteristics going on in our genetics right. uh, as uh, different opposed to what's going on in Africa. And so in order to uh, try out uh, the Ebola or to try out uh, a vaccine on it, um, what better way than just to go ahead and bring it over and selectively introduce it to um, uh, uh, un, uh, unwilling participants uh, in order to get their uh, uh, yeah. get their study over with? That's a uh, and that was something uh, that they brought up to me. That's a, a, a good possibility, and we're going to have to uh, keep our our attention. You know, uh, don't forget that Ebola is out there. Caller, thank you for the call. We're going to go to another caller, but uh, it was a great call, great information, and especially that last point you made. Just because Ebola is out of the headlines, don't uh, don't let yourself forget about it because you never know what kind of surprises they can pull next. We're going to go to a caller from Montana next, area code 406. You're up next. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Greetings, Doug and Joe. I just uh, I was uh, wanted to make a comment that I thought would bring balance to this whole question that comes up all the time about the tribulation rapture, pre-trib or post-trib rapture. Just the concept, how subjective people are in America. You know, we're over here where we can still eat what we want, go where we want, do what we want. And everybody thinks they're going straight from the potluck to heaven, but all you have to do is realize that Fox's Book of Martyrs is written in the same dispensation we're in, that millions of people have been butchered for their faith in Jesus Christ, and all over the world right now, from uh, Indonesia to uh, Africa and Sudan and, and so many places, Christians are being butchered everywhere for what they believe. Tell the brothers in North Korea they don't have to go through tribulation. They've been bleeding for what they believe for many years. And the main thing that that is irrelevant in one sense is totally irrelevant, uh, whether it's as long as you understand that people are suffering for Jesus Christ, then you may be called to do the same. And so we need to arm ourselves, as it says in the, the first book of Peter, fourth chapter, uh, for as much as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself with the same mind. And I think that uh, 
the main thing, if, a, if, if for some reason there is such a thing as a pre-tribulation rapture, a person that's prepared themselves won't lose. But like uh, Doug was saying, that if we find ourselves facing crisis with the people that have prepared themselves for uh, a party, they're going to have a hard time dealing with it, you know. And that's uh, in Matthew 24 when he speaks and says, there will be tribulations so great such as never was since the beginning of the world or ever again shall be. And except those days would be short and no flesh would be saved. We're coming into some very intense times. And uh, the best thing we can do, no matter what your theological dispensation is, go read Fox's Book of Martyrs or The Martyr's Mirror and see what brothers have been going through for 2,000 years. Burned at the stake, I'd call that great tribulation. Uh, you, you know, put on a rack for Jesus Christ, skinned alive. It's happened to brothers all over the world. And the best thing we can do is arm ourselves with the mind to suffer and be prepared to stand in this day no matter what comes. Caller, thank you much. Yeah, you've you've made some great, excellent points. We really appreciate it. God bless you, man. You were really fantastic points. Appreciate the call. Thank you. Wow. All right. A lot of information in that. Uh, a lot of information crammed in there. Go ahead. We got a caller from seven six zero. Seven six zero. We're coming to you now. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Hey, Joe and Doug. Sorry, I uh, actually wasn't waiting to talk today, but. Uh, so thanks for your great show. Appreciate it. Thanks for having Stan on, and uh, just keep up the good work. Thank you. All right, brother. Thanks much. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Joe, I've got a news item here. I just want um, to, to turn people on to or alert people to. You know, we talk about, for example, we talk about uh, pedophilia and uh, abortion. We talk about all the moral crimes and uh, immor- immorality in, in the uh just all of this. We talk about this, but uh, Life Dynamics, well, actually, uh, childpredators.com found this report, this research. Men who sexually abuse minor children, and, and this is uncomfortable to talk about, but this is relevant to what we're seeing happen today. It's uncomfortable to listen to. Yeah, I, uh, no, I get that. Um, the men, in particular, who sexually abuse minor children, young girls, and impregnate them as a result of this rape, they most frequently turn to abortion to cover up their crimes. Now, the reason I brought this up is because we're seeing this um, this death grip on uh, yeah. pro, uh, uh, Planned Parenthood and, and these abortion clinics and mills and, and such. And uh, uh, this one... Uh, Life Dynamics has documented how the abortion industry cooperates with this cover-up by not reporting the pregnancy to authorities. And again, this this can be found if you're if you want ammunition for the pro-abortion, pro-murderous crowd. Just go to childpredators.com and check out the research there. Um, in almost in almost every case of adult men having sex with minor girls. The perpetrators are aware that the relationship is illegal and could land them in prison. So, you know, look, let's get rid of the evidence. And um, that's uh, very yeah. disturbing. And how does it work when the, uh, you know, legal guardian is the person disposing of, you know, is the one who committing, committed the abuse and is the one who is uh, allowed to legally sign over for that abortion to take place? Um, it really paints right. a, a picture that is, um, I mean, it, it's just so heartbreaking and sad. Um, another few pieces of news here while we close out the program I wanted to get into. We didn't get a chance yet. This from AP, United Nations Resolution, Israel Must Renounce Nuclear Arms. The UN General Assembly overwhelmingly approved an Arab-backed resolution Tuesday calling to Israel to renounce possession of nuclear weapons and put its nuclear facilities under investigational oversight. The resolution adopted in a 161-5 to vote know that Israel is the only Middle Eastern country that is not party to the treaty on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. It is called on Israel to accede to that treaty without further delay, do not develop, produce, test, or otherwise acquire nuclear weapons, to renounce possession of nuclear weapons, and put its nuclear facilities under the safeguard of the UN's International Atomic Energy Agency. The United States, Canada, Palaalu, 
and Micronesia joined Israel in opposing the measure, while 18 countries abstained. Israel was widely considered to possess nuclear arms, but declined to confirm it. The resolution included by Egypt echoed a similar Arab-backed effort that failed to gain approval in September at the Vienna-based IAEA. At the same time, Israel criticized Arab countries for undermining dialogue by repeatedly singling out the Jewish state in international arenas. Israel's UN mission did not immediately return a request for comment Tuesday. And I think it's interesting here that they're asking for the Israel to... Uh, renounce and, and get rid of all of its nuclear weaponry and ability to produce nuclear weapons on their surrounding countries, uh, from Jordan to Saudi Arabia to uh, these countries in Turkey have lots of nuclear weapons. Um, it, it's it's uh, especially when they're they amassed against this. Israel. That's right. That's right. Um, Changing gears, we're, we're going to toss a lot of stuff at you here. We're tossing a lot of stuff at you. Folks, one thing this holiday season, a top trending toy. I don't know whether you saw this, Joe, uh, folks, ladies and gentlemen. Is believe it, it or not. Is it Dollar General toy? Um, no, okay. no, 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 no. Yeah, the top trending toy, or one of the top trending toys this season, um, is, believe it or not, the Ouija board. Okay. In fact, sales are up over, I think, 300%. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, now, attributing the recent resurgent rise in popularity of the Ouija board uh, is the recent, what, October release, I think it was, of, the, of, of a movie called Ouija. Ouija, you know, Ouija board. Uh, Ouija. But I've never heard of that movie, so uh, I, I don't know. But But the bottom line is, it's up 300 percent, and um, one one thing that I, in closing this this talking about this out, uh, at least on my end, um, when I was looking at different forums and how people were reacting to this news, I was just as a, a conservative Christian that I, I believe uh, based on. A number of the well, based on my research, wrote this. I think it's basically just a, 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 an inanimate object, and it's boring. Okay, to me, that is um, wow. That is un, uninformed, ignorant, um, and dangerous to think that way. But so, the folks, I, hopefully, you're not one of those who, who believe in. Uh, buying a Ouija board for a no. child. Okay. I would hope okay. not. And yeah. um, right. this last headline, we'll hit this tomorrow. Uh, or no, we won't hit this tomorrow. We will hit this with Paul McGuire on th- uh, Is the IRS going to censor sermons at your church? An atheist group wants to censor what priests, pastors, rabbis, and other clergy say in their sermons by threatening an IRS challenge of their tax-exempt status. Generally, Leaders of the House of Worship in America have the constitutional right to preach, promote any sort of outright endorsement. Uh, it says they, they have, the leaders of the House of Worship have the constitutional right to preach and promote anything short of an outright endorsement of a political candidate. But now this freedom is being challenged. In the 2012 Freedom from Inform- uh, Religion Foundation, a, a atheist organization they advocate and sued uh, for the IRS for seeking to force the agency to question the tax-exempt status of churches and other houses of worship if they preach on moral issues in a way that has political implications. From July, on July 17th, the Freedom From Religious Foundation formally agreed to dismiss the lawsuit voluntarily with assurances from the IRS that the agency no longer has a policy of non-enforcement against churches. The lawsuit filed in U.S. District Court for Washington or for the Western District of Wisconsin, was dismissed without prejudice, meaning the atheist group could receive or re- revive it at any time if the IRS reverts to its previous inaction. This is very important, and we're going to get in, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys why uh, this is so important, and this is something that I would like to get into with Paul McGuire on Thursday. Uh, Bloom, okay, the Daily Signal, this is where I'm reading this from, who... And what is the Freedom of Religion Foundation? What is the campaign they've launched against these houses of worship? Uh, Bloomberg says this Freedom of Religious Foundation as a militant atheist group seeks to marginalize religious 
and religion in public life and to demonize it generally. The lawsuit is just was dismissed out of step worse than usual. It failed to uh, it's failed to attempt to use everyone's favorite government agency, the IRS, to censor private religious speech. What pastors say to their congregants during religious services is irrelevant to the IRS. What does the IRS have to monitor or their sermons or why? It says the IRS has seized an old law, the Johnson Amendment, which was pushed through by an at-risk pol- uh, politician to censor what some nonprofits were saying about him. The IRS expanded it through the regulation system to ban pastors from using code words such as pro-life in their religious instructions in church services. And it goes on to explain the Johnson Amendment from there. But uh, uh, sir, the IRS... Right. Uh, to censor sermons at your church, if you want the title or the the article. And, and and folks, be very very clear about this. Let us be very clear about this. You will, and I guarantee you, you will be victimized by censorship by censorship of Christian words uh, from the pulpit. And um, there's an article out there. Uh, I'm not going. We don't have time to get into it, but there's an article out there. Um, uh, by, by someone who had attended um, or who had listened to uh, uh, Joel Olstein actually making an appearance in Cleveland, Ohio. And, and I'm not going to get into it, but uh, um, they're not going to censor Joel Olstein or people like him and because, of course, of the type of Christianity being preached, which goes from accomplishments to... Uh, energy and vitality and, and inner strength and that Zen type of thing versus the historical biblical Christian teachings of salvation and, and other things. Uh, it, and that's all I'm going to say. On faith. That. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that's all I'm going to say on the topic. But but expect uh, expect us to be censored. Expect you to be victims of censorship as we go through this crisis. With that, I want to thank each and every one of you guys for listening to us tonight. You have a great evening. We'll be back here tomorrow live with Steve Quayle. Until then, stay safe and God bless you. And don't forget, send your questions. Send your questions on the contact form. Have a great night, everyone.